Hey, first leading us off tonight, we have a few uh, presentations. First of which is the Spirit of Yucca Valley Award, and we are honored to uh, present that this evening to Mr. Bob Stevenson. I have a few notes I'd like to go through before uh, we come out there and present it. Uh, Bob has, uh, Bob, if you didn't know, is the guy that's uh, running the camera at all of our meetings. He's not up there now, but uh, he's standing there. Um, Bob, um, for years and years and years, has done the government meetings, uh, the streaming, the videotaping, uh, everything on that technical end of things, he's covered that for not just the town of Yucca Valley, the High Desert Water District, the City of 29 Palms, the government agencies throughout the basin, and he's done so faithfully, uh, showing up all the time to the meetings, staying on top of all the technology, uh, and making sure that, that we all have a good presentation on our website and in person, and uh, he's uh, just invaluable. But. Uh, not really recognized because he's always behind the scenes and behind the camera. Bob moved to uh, Yucca Valley with his family in 1965, and if that, my math is correct, that's about 57 years ago. He started off owning a photography business located in what's currently the Old Town area of Yucca Valley. Uh, at one point, he joined the High Desert Star staff as a photographer in 1973. He was a member of the High Desert Water District Board of Directors, 1969 to 73. And um, he's kept up with the advances in technology for us, steadily increased his knowledge and investment over the years to make sure we have a good product. His resume includes assisting movie director Steven Spielberg, Spielberg with recording hundreds of uh, Holocaust survivors. And uh, he's shared his talent with the Morongo Basin Historical Society. Bob's kind of an almanac. Uh, he, he has been around all of, all of everything that happens in Yucca Valley and recorded it through pictures, uh, videos, uh, streaming, uh, everything. He, he knows everything, he retains everything. He knows stuff about me that I don't know about me. He remembers stuff <laughs> about, about everybody in town and he can, uh, he's an extremely valuable uh, resource uh, to the community. But like I say, he's been uh, faithful in coming to all the meetings. 99% of the time he does it in person and uh, you can always count on him. He's the first one here and the last one to go. So we're honored to be able to present the uh, Spirit of Yucca Valley Award uh, to Bob Stevenson this evening. And I'll if you'll join me, Bob, out at, the, out at the front there. Okay, this is the Spirit of Yucca Valley Award. This certificate is awarded to Bob Stevenson for your positive contributions to the town of Yucca Valley over the last several years. Your dedication and commitment is appreciated by the citizens of Yucca Valley and the Yucca Valley Town Council, presented this 21st day of June, 2022. So, Bob, thank you. Do you have anything you'd like to? Okay, uh, I guess it was November 27th, 1991. And uh, there's two people in this room. You were here, I was here, and uh, we had a couple folding chairs and uh, folding tables. And, and we had a radio station here at that time, I think, and they did a live remote from here, remember that? Yeah. KCDs. So uh, it was a real exciting evening. So anyhow, I uh, started this just as a help out, and it turned into a, actually turned into a business to where I believe uh, I think with the water districts and counting meetings and uh, uh, all the town council meetings, and it turned out that after doing some calculating that I, I think I've done 2,500 meetings, you know, and uh, which is unheard of, you know, who would want to do that, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, uh, and of course, I, I've been vocal about things, and and I have opinions, and so my opinion tonight is about the town of Yucca Valley. I, I've been through all of it, and there's ups and downs, and I think this is probably the best gathering of uh, officials and board and uh, council members that I've ever seen. And uh, I really applaud you. You all have not something nice to contribute all the time. Good ideas. Uh, you guys are humorous at times to each other. Um, dedicated and uh, that's what you get the big bucks for. So. <laughs> but I want to thank you for this award, and uh, we'll see if I get any, any others in any other organizations. But keep up the good work. You've got a great staff. The council is just as balanced as can be. And uh, that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Do you do want those? Yeah, they want a video of this. <laughs> yes, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. You want me to take you home? And he goes back to work. Bob told me before the meeting that, or, yeah, before we started, that he was going to ask for the timer to be set at 15 minutes. For him. <laughs> and I noticed it didn't even start, so good job. Mayor, Mayor Schooler, I'd like to say one thing, if I could. Oh, sure. Any council members, yeah. Um, I'd like to say that uh, I'm reminded I still go to Bob's YouTube page to look at our council meetings if I miss it and it's just easy to access. But when I was on there the other day, I noticed he had Grub Steak Days 1985 on there. And he filmed the whole parade and there were interviews, him and Gary Dinho were interviewing people and someone else was and it was really cool. Um, also, I wanna mention, um, I met Bob a long time ago. He probably doesn't remember me from back then, but I've known him for like the last 10 or 15 years fairly well and, but, when I was in high school, my friend Ben Costello would do a lot of plays and he would be at the Playhouse and they would do performances and Bob would film those and uh, he was a good friend of my friend Ben. And uh, he actually uh, converted some Super 8 movies I had from when my kids were little onto a DVD and onto a flash drive. So yeah, he's an incredible person. He's been around a long time. and. And he used to own a monkey, if people don't know that. <laughs> Bob, uh, thank you very much, and congratulations. The word that came to me, uh, as you mentioned, how many meetings you sat through, is long-suffering. Uh, it's hard enough sitting through a, one meeting, let alone that many meetings through all the years. But I wanted to read this. It says, contrary to popular view, a person who is long-suffering is not weak or meek. Instead, he or she is strong in character and bold in resilience. And uh, that is a great attribute. And thank you so much for your professionalism. And thank you for your long-suffering through very many meetings that I'm sure could be very, very boring. Any other council members? Yeah. I, I... Bob, I think uh, I remember very fondly those days at the Playhouse in Joshua Tree when you were filming a variety of things that uh, I had the fortune to be in with Ben Costello and uh, several other people from town and um, Fran Demick and all that crew. It was a lot of, a lot of fun and it really uh, helped foster that feeling of family that uh, grew up there and in this town, and it's still a, you've always been a big part of uh, documenting that, and uh, just, it, it's uh, really neat to see you get this award, and it's long deserved, 
and uh, we thank you for all your effort. Yeah, and just quickly, thank you for all your work. You know, you truly are a part of Yucca Valley. Uh, we went sidebar and talked about stories of things that you videoed or photographed, historical events within our community. Uh, there's so many things that you have in the depth that you've done in our community to record it and retain the history of it. Uh, but the best part is that sometimes uh, we start talking and you're kidding around a lot and having a good time with what you do. And we truly appreciate it. You are one thing uh, uh, just reliable and uh, very interested in what we do. And I appreciate your feedback when we're standing around talking before the meetings and after the meetings. So thanks for always being a part, not just someone that's you know taking the video of it, but you're a piece of our town. All right, thanks everybody. Did staff want to uh, get into the next one? We have a retirement, uh, employee retirement, Shane. Thank you, Bob. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, sorry, Art. Uh, we're gonna hear a little bit more about uh, Bob from Art Miller. Mm -hmm. Art, Art Miller, um, I came to town a few years before Bob. I uh, knew him as a kid uh, back in the 60s and uh, He's been a real asset to this community. He's, he's contributed a lot, um, and it's all been very positive. I have to say that because he knows just as much as about me as I know about him, so we have to stay even. And, uh, but uh, no, it's a well-deserved honor, and I uh, pride myself that uh, he's my friend, and we talk and, and converse and talk about people that you've never heard of before, maybe, so, uh, but uh, thank you. Jerry McFeeters, would you please join me up front, please? Oh, it had to happen sooner or later. Sooner or later. Yeah. So I'm probably not going to give Jerry uh, express my thanks to Jerry the way that I should. Um, for 15 years and about four months, the gentleman on my right and I have been having coffee most every morning at six o'clock, and Jerry is going to be retiring. Um, we as users of public facilities in our, in our private lives, what do we look for? We look for cleanliness, the HVAC systems work, the temperature is right, the facilities are stocked, everything works properly. And if you, as you're in this room this evening or any town facility, you know that the town has a very high standard for how we keep our facilities. And Jerry and his team have been responsible for that now for 15 years and coming up on four months. What does that entail? And you've heard some of these numbers before, but I still have to repeat them. 21 town buildings totaling more than 75,000 square feet, 26,000 square feet of floor tile, 18,300 square feet of carpet, 6,000 square feet of glass to keep clean, 50 toilets and urinals. And what do we expect as users of public facilities? I don't care where it is. If it's at your kid's soccer game, softball game, or if you're at the beach, you expect those facilities to be clean and very usable. And I think as the council knows, you can walk into any town facility and ours are at some of the highest levels you'll find anywhere. And that's, um, I think, an illustration of Jerry and his team's commitment to this community. 245 doors, and if you've ever had to maintain doors before, you know that's a lot of doors that you've got to keep functioning and working properly. 700 light fixtures, and then Jerry's crew also does what you see here tonight, the setup and teardowns and those range into the thousands. Some of the notable things that, that Jerry has done recently, um, as you know, we have civil engineers on staff. Civil engineers build roads, they build flood control projects, they build bridges. <clears throat> they don't do buildings. So as we rehab the old library, the old PFF building for County Library and the Welcome Center, Jerry stepped in and filled a huge gap that the engineers were not capable of. I've never told Jerry, I don't think personally, thank you for what he did, but he made those projects happen. Um, he brought the skills, the knowledge, the insight that the engineers didn't have 
to make those turn out successfully. He's been working in advance on the town hall remodel since the library vacated that and as we're moving forward with that project, he's played a huge role in the input on the Prop 68 project from the maintenance and operations perspective. Jerry's upgraded the lighting systems in this organization. He's made huge improvements um, through contract services to the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems in all of our buildings. And if you can imagine having to keep around 50 town employees happy with the temperatures on a regular basis, that's not a very easy thing to do at all. One thing I should have asked Jerry about this before today, uh, probably one of the biggest projects that he's proud of was the rekeying of all of these buildings and all of these locks. How many keys did we have to use before we did the rekey project? Do you remember that number? Oh, well, I started cutting it down. Rusty must have had probably 20, 20 keys on his ring. More than that. More than 20 keys. And today, um, some employees have one key that will open every single lock on vehicles, buildings, park sites, everything. So huge, huge, huge um, cost savings for the town, efficiency measures for the town. Jerry took the lead role in that project. Um, long-term maintenance plan, in, in Jerry's 15 years here, he actually pulled together a long-term facility maintenance plan on when do the buildings need to be re-roofed, when do the floors have to be done, when do the carpets have to be done. That plan is laid out uh, in years, so it's like a capital improvement or capital maintenance program for facilities. Um, Jerry took the facility maintenance program in Yucca Valley when he came on board in 07 and he took it to the next level. So I wanted to say thank you this evening to Jerry. We're going to be sorry to see him go. Most of the time you'll probably find him in his trailer in Afton Canyon. You can recognize his trailer because his flag has a mug of beer flying in the air on it and that's how you'll be able to recognize Jerry. So this evening I want to say thank you to Jerry for 15 years in recognition of his exceptional service to the town of Yucca Valley for over 15 years with sincere appreciation for your dedication, commitment, and professionalism as a valued employee of the town of Yucca Valley. Thank you for your immeasurable contribution to the organization and the community dated this 21st day of June 2022. I do want to say thank you to past councils and current councils and my supervisors I've had here. It started with Shane, dipped over to Jim for a few years and then back to Shane. And it, it's just been great. It, the town has a heck of a team doing all the services we do here. Um, I have to look, make sure. Yeah, James is still here after Shane read the list. So that's a good thing. And, uh, but it, it's, it's, been my pleasure. It's the work I enjoy doing, uh, and I'm. I will still be having my coffee at six o'clock in the morning, but most likely we'll have some mudslide in it. <laughs> so thank you. Well, thanks, sir. <clears throat> well, I um, would like to add that uh, just my appreciation for Jerry and his professionalism over the years. He came to the job. <clears throat> um, with some pretty big shoes to fill uh, and everybody was a little uncertain how somebody could learn all uh, 21, 22 buildings uh, and all the uh, ins and outs and hidden skeletons in the, in the buildings and facilities um, of the town. And Jerry learned right away <clears throat> and took the lead. And uh, I think the most important thing that I, I noticed was uh, his ability to uh, form and maintain relationships with everybody that he needed to, including vendors and contractors and engineers and, and project managers, and just uh, made himself extremely valuable that way. But those relationships were always positive. You know, there was no uh, animosity. And you know, people can be annoying sometimes, but you would never know it. You know, Jerry was just professional about it and um, uh, skilled and competent in, in all of his work. So. I, for one, really appreciate that and wish you well in your retirement. I know you'll be uh, flying that, that beer flag and uh, doing hay rides and exploring the desert. So good luck to you. We wish you well with that. Anybody else? Yeah, I just want to thank you, Jerry, all the times that I've had discussions with you here at town. Super professional, always a bit of levity, fun, but there's a mission to be accomplished. 
and you always focused on that and very professional. And it shows. I'm, I'm very critical of our town, too. Um, as Shane had mentioned, we set a very high standard here, and it's your leadership that kept that crew effective for our goals. And, and we meet them all the time, and it's no easy task, I know that. Um, I've had the opportunity to spend time with you uh, off-duty, too, and I hope to join you in Afton Canyon soon. I'll look for the flag. <laughs> Jerry, great job. Um, thank you for your energy and your uh, cheerfulness. You, you could tell that you really enjoyed the job. It's, uh, it, it's been a great thing for the town, and we, we thank you for your efforts and enjoy your retirement. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> uh, Jerry, thank you so much for all the years. Um, I was so impressed. I asked the town manager to take me over to the old PFF building as it was being renovated and turned into a library that's beautiful. And uh, you met us there, and the expertise, the behind the scenes, um, all the technology, all the ADA requirements, all the, anything and everything, you knew completely about, I was just, my jaw was dropped the entire time you were giving me a, a tour of the facilities. And um, it's just amazing what goes behind, or what goes on with a project like that. Even tougher when you're renovating a building than building from scratch. And, and you just were instrumental in making that just work. And so, um, always respected you, always saw you, never saw you a different in any day. It didn't matter when I ran into you, where you're at, what you were doing. You're the same person every day, and I admired that. Always professional and positive and uh, hardworking. And you set the bar high and the example to everyone, and kudos to you, well-deserved retirement. Jerry, thank you for uh, your hard work, your knowledge, your connections with uh, all the people that you connected with all the time and uh, maintain those relationships. And uh, I want to thank you for your years of service. And I will look for your flag also, because I like to go out and explore the desert. So I'll look for that. All right, thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, next presentation is recognition of outgoing employee. Curtis, did you want to? Yeah, I'll be happy to, to do that. I'm going to bring up a name that you might not be familiar with. Um, <laughs> I'm going to have uh, Mrs. Megan Snyder come up to the podium. And Megan, I'm not going to join you there. I'm fighting a cold, so I'm going to instead have the, the rest of your team there. I see them back there, Candy, Clayton, Jessica. If you could just come up uh, and so that Megan doesn't have to stand there by herself, that would be terrific. Um, you uh, obviously have seen Megan around town for a number of years. Uh, this this occasion is a little bit different than uh, Jerry's retirement. This is a personal life change, and I'll let her talk about that uh, for a little bit. But we will miss her greatly here at the town. For those that don't know, Megan is our rec coordinator too, and is in charge of many of our community service events, practically all of the ones that are public facing. Community services, Mayor, you'll recollect, is an interesting uh, cat in, in the game of municipal government. We provide events and occasions for the public to get together. All of the work goes behind the scenes in the weeks and days leading up to the event, and you have the greatest chance of kind of blowing it with a bunch of people there. And that very, very rarely happens, and uh, thanks to Megan for pulling off many events over the course of the years. Were you on our youth commission? I thought you were, yes. So she started as a youth commissioner with the town recreation assistant, and then went to rec leader, and went to rec coordinator one, and then rec coordinator two, which is her current position. Just a testament to her ability to deliver a high level of service. She was employee of the quarter in 2015, employee of the year in 2018. So Megan, I'll let you share a little bit about what your next steps are, and the council might uh, be interested in hearing that. And then if any of your colleagues want to say what they liked about working, they can do that, uh, but they don't have to, so. Um, so I got married, woo, exciting, yes. Yay. Um, so I will be relocating to Texas where I'm looking to do something similar that I'm currently doing here, but over there. So I just want to thank the council so much for giving me the opportunity to serve for 11 years in five days. Um, it's been such a pleasure and I have 
great coworkers who are super supportive and have really helped me progress in my career and I don't know what I would do without them. So I'm very appreciative to everybody in this room. They've helped me grow so much and thank you so much. Thank you, Megan. You know, um, Mayor, if you, uh, Mayor, if you will, you could go down there and give her her certificate. Sure. That way she doesn't have to deal with me. Um, but I will say it's um, after you left Mayor, the town staff, uh, I had the opportunity to work day to day a little bit with Megan. I, I do remember some of the occasions where we were breaking down uh, concert series in the evenings and then the many activities that go with that. And the things that jump out in my mind still to this day are very positive attitude, um, always and a willingness to do whatever was asked uh, of her. So thank you again, Megan, for all of your service to the town of Yucca Valley. We wish you all of the best as you start a new chapter in, uh, in your life, and we're so excited for you. You can't, can't even stand it. Good luck to you. You know, when, when Megan first started, I was, I was on staff, and um, it was, uh, she came onto the recreation staff, and I uh, was a little bit shy, it seemed like, you know, and we kind of didn't know what to do with her because you can't be shy t for too long in, in recreation. And uh, so she was started off writing press releases, I believe, yep. and uh, quickly advanced. She kind of got over it, it almost overnight. You know, she learned, she learned how to get out there and, and lead, and she learned that kind of to survive, she was going to have to do that. And for someone that never... Um, I mean, she would you'd point a microphone at her and she would run the other way at, at the beginning. She was just so intimidated by a microphone, it seemed. But, you know, you see her out at the events and she takes charge and she leads. And I think the growth that Megan's uh, had, you know, I think she found her niche. It's, uh, she's turned into a natural for a, what we call a recce, you know, at, at the town. But uh, she's turned into a darn good recce, and so we, we wish you well. The certificate is in appreciation, awarded to Megan Stuckel Snyder. In recognition of her exceptional service in the town of Yucca Valley over 11 years with sincere appreciation for your dedication, commitment, and professionalism as a valued employee to the town of Yucca Valley. Thank you for your immeasurable contributions to the organization and the community presented this 21st day of June, 2022. Thank you so much. And Curtis, um, I don't know if you can hear me. I wanted to say a few things about Megan. This is Sue Ernest. Yeah, we can hear you, Sue, go ahead. Uh, I wanted to do a lot of things that Jim said. Um, I'm unable to be there tonight, but I, I just want to express that Megan is such a valuable member of our team. And what people don't know, they know that she does a lot of events and all of that, but she's really the brain trust in our department. Uh, she is the lead administrator for our registration software. She's the one who sets up all of that in our system so people can register. Uh, she works with the tech support. She works with the staff. Uh, she, um, she's the one who solves problems when credit cards aren't being taken and, you know, debugging the system. And so I think what people don't see is her prowess in the background where she's solving all these problems on a daily basis. And I'll ditto what Mayor Schooler said I've known her since she was a teenager when she started working here and to watch her grow into this, just her professional voice now is so polished and I'm so proud to see her work. And anytime I get an email and I see, you know, her interacting with vendors and the public and I, I think about how much she's grown while she's worked here and it's just really rewarding and congratulations, Megan. We're so happy for you and wish you all the best. Thank you. Uh, Kendi. Thank you, Megan. Any other staff? Candy, Clayton? Might as well just stay here. <laughs> oh, there's more. I just want to tell everybody here that I've known Megan for 24 years. You used to go to after school programs and day camps. And she was a little girl who would crawl up in my lap and say, Miss Candy, can I just read my book? I don't want to do that craft. <laughs> and so I know, no, no, you got to start the craft. You got to do the craft. And so she would throw some glue and some glitter and speech. She was done. 
<laughs> now can I read you my book, Miss Candy? So we did that together for I don't know, quite a few years. And then we worked we together with the Youth Commission. And then Megan was a recce. And then there were some changes and I wasn't here for a while. <laughs> and then I came back and Megan was my boss. <laughs> she was the absolute best. I learned so much from her, just being around her. So I will miss you. I'll miss you more than any of the rest of these people. <laughs> We've worked together for six years in a month or two. Um, the first couple weeks we were working together, um, we were getting ready to launch summer related stuff, aquatics, concert series, something, and she goes to give me a pat on the back and I step forward and she misses and just smacks the bejesus out of me. And the look on her face was so priceless, I just let it ride. So we still joke about that to this day. And uh, we're going to be losing a tremendous amount of institutional knowledge. Um, Whenever there's a question about how you do something, where you find something, where something's stored, um, how we did it five years ago, three years ago, 10 years ago, um, this is the person that we go to. Um, so tremendous coworker, um, tremendous loss to the department. So thank you. Okay. Don't walk away so quick, Megan. <laughs> we don't get to meet the man that's taking you away. Yeah, no, he's not coming tonight. Sorry. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we he's still in love. Texas. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. That's quite all right. <laughs> okay, congratulations, all of you. Um, we'll move on to the approval of the agenda. Is there a motion? Mayor, I'll move that we move uh, that we approve tonight's agenda as prepared. Mayor, I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Council members Abel? Yes. Dennison? Yes. Droz? Yes. Lombardo? Yes. And Mayor Schooler? Yes. Uh, the consent agenda, all items listed on the consent agenda are routine matters or formal documents covering previous town council instruction. Items are enacted by one motion and a second without separate discussion unless a member of the town council or town staff requests dialogue on a specific item at the beginning of the meeting. Requests for public comment on the consent agenda items should be filed with the town clerk. Is there any member of the public that wishes to comment on any item on the consent agenda? Seeing none, anybody online? No, any council member? No. Mayor, no questions, but I'd like to move the item. We have a motion. I'll second that we move uh, consent agenda four through 17. Council members Abel? Yes. Dennison? Yes. Droz? Yes. Lombardo? Yes. And Mayor Schooler? Yes. We move on to item number 18, acceptance of donation in memory of Jeremy King. Can we have a staff report, please? Yes, Mayor and Council. This is the acceptance of a donation in memory of Jer Jeremy L. King. The recommendation is that the town council accept the donation from Ms. Michelle Maresh and the Tri-Valley Little League organization of one park bench and two park tables in memory of Jeremy L. King. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to introduce our rec coordinator, Jessica Kuna, to present the PowerPoint with the highlights of this donation. After that, we'd like to allow Ms. Maresh and her family to make any comments they would like to the council. And then the mayor can accept public comment, and we hope that you'll vote to accept this donation. So to uh, introduce Jessica Kuna, thank you. Uh, good evening, mayor and council. So this is a staff report for the acceptance of the donation in memory of Jeremy L. King. So again, the recommendation is that the council accept the donation from Ms. Michelle Maresh and the Tri-Valley Little League organization of one park bench and two park tables in memory of Jeremy L. King. So on December 21st, 2022, the town was approached by Ms. Michelle Maresh and the members of the Tri-Valley Little League organization to offer the donation funds collected in memory of her son, Jeremy L. King, for the purchase of park tables for the placement at Pop Rosh Park. So Jeremy Leslie King was a hometown boy who attended Yucca Valley schools and graduated from Copper Mountain College. He joined the Navy, serving for seven years and receiving medals and awards for his achievements. He continued his civilian career at 29 Palms Marine Corps Air Ground Combat Center, where he was honored to work and 
mentor many young Marines before moving to the private sector working for Microsoft. Jeremy loved his hometown and was active in adult softball and golf, even serving as a town umpire for the Adult Softball League. He was an active sports dad in baseball, softball, and soccer, always cheering on his children with pride and enthusiasm. He was happiest at the Tri-Valley Little League fields, where he coached his kids on the fields that he himself played on as a kid. He coached, umpired, and volunteered countless hours supporting his children and their teammates while teaching them life skills through the games. So in memory of Jeremy's generosity and kindness, uh, Ms. Maresh and the Tri-Valley Little League organization gathered donations totaling $4,705 to fund a gener generous and meaningful donation of several pieces of beautiful park furnishings to be placed at Pop Rush Park. The furnishings include a precast concrete bench with a bronze memorial plaque dedicated to Jeremy and two precast um, concrete picnic tables in a special quill hill red color in, tri in tribute to Jeremy's enthusiasm, contributions, and the love of youth sports. These high quality park amenities will bring comfort to park goers and for many years to come. The memorial bench and tables were purchased and placed at the park on April 27, 2022. They are being enjoyed by Tri-Valley Little League players and their families. So again, the, the recommend, recommendation is that the council accept a donation from Ms. Michelle Maresh and the Tri-Valley Little League organization of one park bench and two park tables in memory of Jeremy L. King. The town would like to accept and recognize this generous donation and offer the sincerest condolences to Jeremy's family. The town extends its thanks to Ms. Michelle Maresh as well as Jennifer Cusack, Debbie Cardner, and Paul Hoffman of the Tri-Valley Little League organization for making this donation possible. I will have Ms. Maresh come up to say a few words and answer any questions you may have following public comment. Ooh, that was harder than I thought. Um, as difficult and as painful as the loss of Jeremy, has been for us, um, his family and his friends. We're really grateful to the town of Yucca Valley and all the volunteers of Tri-Valley Little League to accept the donation in Jeremy's name. <clears throat> I am so proud of my son's accomplishments in life and his involvement in baseball and softball in, in the community as, as well as soccer and everything else he did. Um, I know that he is proud of what he did and he's proud of what we're doing, and I'm proud of that too. Um, we hope this donation will be enjoyed for many, many years, and all of us in his family are really humbled knowing that we're able to provide just this little area on the softball fields for families to make many, many memories of their own, because that's where I have my best memories of my son. So thank you very much. We are all grateful, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Maris. Is uh, any, any other public comment on this? Any other members of the public wishing to comment on this? Online? Bring it back to the council for comment. Anybody? Thank you, Ms. Maris, for coming here and, and working with us to get through this moment. I went to the uh, field the day that those were delivered, and I got to witness them and, and the beauty that they are and the use that they're receiving. Uh, as we saw in the photographs, was just heartwarming. Um, it, it's a good, it's a good uh, reminder to everybody uh, how valuable our life is and how these kinds of team sports that your son enjoyed so much are a real piece of our fabric of our community. So thank you for continuing that and keeping uh, his name alive to those ball players out there. I appreciate your time. Well said. Anybody else? No. Um, I would just add that. Uh, I, our hearts go out to you, a big loss in your family and the community. Uh, a guy like that uh, just contributed, and I remember seeing him out at the golf course with uh, Keegan a lot of the time, and uh, just uh, seemed like a super nice guy and, and good member of the community. So uh, we thank you for, for uh, this contribution to the town, to the parks, and in his memory, and, and uh, just our hearts go out to you on this. But uh, at this point, I'll take a motion to accept the donation. I'll move that we accept the donation. 
I'll second the donation acceptance. Council members Abel? Yes. Dennison? Yes. Droz? Yes. Lombardo? Yes. And Mayor Schooler? Yes. Thank you again. Okay, the next item on the agenda, item number 19, one we've been waiting for for a while, the architectural and engineering design update for the Prop 68 Aquatics and Recreation Center project. Thank you, Mayor, council members. Um, we're gonna bring up the presentation this evening on our Prop 68 Aquatics and Recreation Center project. Go over it today. This is a, a milestone day for us in the design process. This is one of your first significant milestones, uh, schematic design proposal review. Just by way of background, you'll recollect uh, some of the most recent highlights on March uh, of 2021. You authorized the release of RFP for project management services. Um, that was awarded to Dallin Group in June of 2021, so just about a year ago. Uh, Stephanie is here from Dallin Group and she'll be joining the presentation at the end, uh, provide her uh, assessment of where we're at as project manager. And then earlier this year in January, the town council approved and awarded professional service agreement for a &E, or architectural and engineering design consultant services to HMC architects in the amount of uh, $1.9 million uh, design contract. Um, all of that uh, occurred at the beginning of the year. So you've probably been wondering, well, what have you guys been doing in the last six months? And so this is an evening where we can share that with you and uh, let you see where we're at on the project. Um, I think when we did the, uh, the award of contract, HMC was here, but we didn't have a ton of time for, the, for you to get to know them either. So this is a chance for you to see boots on the ground as that work progresses and the people behind it. So we're really excited to have this opportunity uh, for you this evening. Let's go ahead to the next slide. I'm sorry, go back to that previous slide and throw you a curveball. Okay. That's pretty amazing. Uh, and this is what we wanted to share with you this evening. This is, um, this is our vision uh, and not only a vision, but this is the design path that we're going down. Uh, we'll talk about how far along we are in the design path, what's, uh, you know, what's, what's been decided, what's still to come. But I think just that picture in and of itself should be um, pretty exciting for this entire community. It's been a long, a long process. All right, let's go to the next slide. Uh, again, as I indicated earlier in January, uh, we brought on HMC Architects and uh, that kind of that picture behind it was what the council had envisioned through the review process through our um, community advisory group. You'll recollect that was a group of about 15 community members that provided input uh, we had the work of an, a prior consultant that helped us do some of the conceptualizing, some of the public outreach, um, the uh, input that we received from each segment in our community to try and come back with a design process and a design product that reflects the needs of this community. Next slide. Uh, this is something that I'm, I'm quite proud of. This is our multi-department approach team on this project. All 10 of the members here are on almost every call. We meet uh, once a week, either in person or via remote with HMC, with Dallin, and uh, with this team here. If you can imagine trying to make decisions on uh, everything from a layout to amenities, uh, with 10 people, maybe 12, uh, and then the architect team, you would think you wouldn't get anything done. But um, thankfully, this team gets along very well, provides input. Everyone's not afraid to give their opinions, give their input as we move forward. And so far, it's been uh, working tremendously. Next slide. So the project management team, uh, again, Stephanie Fujimura is here today, and she'll talk about uh, her perspective as project manager uh, representing Dallin Group. Uh, and then that next box there at the bottom right, HMC Architects. Um, Cummings, by the way, is the cost estimator for Dallin. HMC also has uh, their own cost estimating component, which they can talk about um, probably at a subsequent meeting, but they, they have that same capacity. Next slide. So with that, I'm going to introduce HMC Architects. Uh, I'm not certain exactly how they want to introduce themselves, but I'll uh, let Brad come up of the entire team, and they're going to take the presentation from here. 
Uh, we'll go all the way through the end. Um, we may interject at different points if there's something that we want to highlight. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, budget overview, and then at the end, I've asked Stephanie to come up and talk about some of the challenges as well as the strengths of what she's seen in the project management side. So with that, uh, Brad, turn it over to you. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah, thank you, Curtis. And before I introduce our team, I would just like to say thank you to the town council because it's been a privilege to work with your staff. Uh, as Curtis mentioned, it's been an incredibly collaborative uh, a learning in, uh, environment for both us, the architects, and for you, the town. So it's been great. We actually look forward to our Wednesday morning, our morning prep to drive out here as uh, Curtis and team. They give us snacks, they give us drinks. It's, it's really a pretty amazing thing for us architects to get that sometimes. So uh, we appreciate all the work we've done and most of the people are here in the room. And I didn't know if Jerry's retiring because it realizes that his, uh, the square footage in the town is gonna go up by 50% with this project. So. Uh, it's a great, great project we're having here. So my name is Brad Glasick. I'm from HMC Architects. I'm the principal in charge. So I try to make sure all the work gets done on time. I don't do a lot of the work. The other people behind me do most of that. And I'll introduce John Orr. He is our project designer, uh, doing an amazing job on this project. And then we have also Adeline Contreras, who is the project manager, uh, really working with uh, Stephanie day to day on the coordination. You also see on the slide Sergio, who is our director of interior design, which is really kind of right where we're in the middle of right now, really figuring out a lot of the interiors of this. Those are the core team members. We also have probably about four or five other staff members in house, and they have a team of about 10 engineers or so that make up the full A&E team for us here. So thank you again for your time tonight. Yeah, I'm John. It's a pleasure to be here. Like Brad said, it's been a really exciting project to be a part of. Um, I'm looking forward to taking my kids in the pool um, pretty soon here once we get it, once we get it going. And uh, yeah, Jerry, sorry to, uh, we'll be losing you soon. Appreciate all the help so far. Um, like Brad has said, it's been a great collaborative experience. We're usually in this room, um, hashing it out. Um, it's, it's been a great team to get along with. And uh, yeah, and you'll see Sergio again soon enough. I shouldn't say he has COVID, so we can't bring him, but he only has the stuff he knows, so he will be back soon. Um, okay. Uh, today, uh, we were asked to come share a project update of where we are to date. Uh, as Curtis had mentioned, um, we were given direction in January to go ahead and begin services, and we have been working really through uh, today uh, with the town staff, uh, with the steering committee team um, that Curtis described, uh, with Dalen, the project management team, uh, towards this schematic design. I'll give you a somewhat brief overview. Uh, as Curtis has said, feel free to interrupt at any time if you like. We'll also have Q&A at the end if you want to dive in into anything. Um, but we really encourage a collaborative model in general in the way we work. So uh, feel free to raise your hand if you see something along the way. We've been going through this process. The way we work, we really see ourselves as partners uh, with the town. Um, we believe that the best designs come through iteration. They don't just come out of the sky, right? We have to sit down and do the work and we work together. Um, this little map here sort of conceptually shows you the process we've gone through uh, in the last few months, starting with project visioning. That's us understanding what you need, what you want. Um, you guys had a well-developed program when we started, but this helps us read between the lines um, of what's on that sheet of paper. We start out real loose with design exploration looking at all different ideas, the way this uh, facility could take shape and what the benefits are. That sort of refines as we move to the right there on that map, um, as we develop really more rigorous test fits on the site, looking at the space you have, um, looking at the results on the building and the flow. And that ultimately culminated in these three options, these three conceptual designs on the right. Um, we developed uh, the one on the top to be part of this schematic design proposal, uh, but we will give you a little overview of some of the other routes we've taken along the way, um, because that might be interesting for the team to see uh, where we've come. Like I said, we started with uh, a visioning session that was right here in this room. This is very open-ended, right? We start very broad, uh, and we looked at what are the uses here. Some of these things are images to get people's response. Some of them are just simply words. Um, we talked about who the users are of this facility and, and who the users aren't. What's, what are other things you already have in town that you don't need to fulfill with this project? All of that helps us narrow in on the big idea. Uh, some of this just came out in words, right? The big one, I think, right in the middle stood out really strong, right? I mean, we know people are coming here for fitness, maybe for aquatic competition, for basketball league, but the big word in the middle is fun. Um, we definitely heard that as a big 
uh, goal for the project. Also something iconic, something unique to Yucca Valley, um, something that's recognizable, um, learning to swim, um, health and wellness for the community, and I know multi-generational access, something that brings the community together at all ages uh, was something we really heard early on, which again, helped us understand better what you were trying to get to. Let me just jump in here real quick. Um, one of the words there that you see in uh, pink there is iconic, and I think it's a good time for us to recognize the work that Assembly Member Chad Mays did uh, through Prop 68 writing language in there to provide a specified grant for the town of Yucca Valley. Um, in discussions with Chad, uh, he, you know you know how he operates, and you know uh, the type of uh, feedback you're going to get from him is going to be very direct. Um, and that was, uh, I think, one of his words as well, is iconic. We want this to be what Yucca Valley can be in the future, not looking backwards. And so that we've kind of kept that uh, as a key word throughout the entire project, and hope, hopefully you'll see that as uh, Jonathan continues and, and moves forward with the presentation and, and what we ended up with, and then uh, even more importantly, how we got there and how we validated that. Another thing we spoke about as a team uh, early on is climate as a driver of design. I don't need to tell anybody in this room, the most, one of the most attractive things about Yucca Valley is getting outside, um, but there's a wide range of weather, right? It snows, it's 115, um, and some days it's just perfect. Um, so uh, we talked a lot about what does it mean to build a really robust facility in Yucca Valley. Um, these little, ro these are called wind roses here. We don't need to get into the details, but just to say we dug into what does the wind do on different seasons? What does the temperature do? Um, and what that means to the way we all live when we're out here um, in terms of the difference between being blazing hot and comfortable or freezing cold might be as simple as walking around to the other side of a hill or one of the, uh, the rocky ridge lines that we have out here um, to get out of the sun or into the sun or out of the wind. Um, that's something we see people and animals do all over out here. Um, yeah, as I said, there's a lot of extremes of temperature right there at the site, um, right? There's, it does snow out there. It's two of our design meetings. We came out the morning after it had snowed in the hills. Um, but, um, you know, it was definitely not snowing today. Um, so we looked at a whole lot of strategies for how to best manage energy efficiency, right? There is a first cost of this building, but there's also the lifestyle costs, um, or the life cycle costs, rather. Um, those really come down to excellent building envelope, managing those extremes of temperature, uh, putting the glass and the glazing in the right places so that we don't overheat the building when it's hot, um, and putting the openings where they're sheltered from wind. Now with all that background in our pocket, we said now's the time to dream a little bit. Let's get a little more loose. And we did some collaborative exercises, again, together with the whole project team um, here in this building. We have these simple foam blocks. This is very low tech. It is not fancy, but it works really well because we can put down all the big pieces of program that we get, all those items that were on the list, and talk about what wants to live next to something else, what needs to be separate, um, how does this fit on the site? And we really, we came up with just we move them all over the place. Everybody's got their hands in there. It's really collaborative. But what it does is help us understand what the criteria are that are driving the process. And then we go into prototyping where we step away as your design consultant and start generating, okay, what do all these different schemes <coughs> turn into? What kind of categories do we have? So in this example, here are five different categories of organizational schemes. Um, you can see we have the indications of the wind and the sun, and that informs well, if we spill out this direction, you might be sheltered from the wind, but you might be in the sun more than you like to. Or there's great security opportunities in this other scheme. Um, having gone through all of those, uh, we found a preferred option for oh, we found our preferred option for development um, after two or three iterations, which is this here. This scheme uses the bulk of the building to shelter that outdoor uh, pool duck space. Um, it provides some excellent connections, which we'll see when we show the site plan, out to Brimfield. We, that's one thing we heard a lot that was not sort of in the program was how critical that connection to uh, the soccer fields and the park are um, for enhancing the use of both the new facility and the existing facilities going forward. So this is our proposed overall site plan. Uh, right at the very bottom of that graphic, that's Little League Drive. That's the existing parking lot. Um, and as we head up, the building is this large white mass here, um, simplified. That's your front door entrance. As I mentioned, the building sort of curves around on the west side to help shelter from hot summer sun on that outdoor pool deck. And you'll see that when we get to the architectural floor plan. 
Uh, it's directly abutted up next to the existing soccer fields. Uh, and so I was just saying that was identified as a real opportunity for the town to advertise the presence of this facility to the community that's using the fields and to encourage people to go use the fields when they're coming to this facility once it's popular. There's a really nice opportunity for those things to have a synergy and increase the use of the facility by all generations um, for health and wellness. Another aspect that came up was the opportunity to open up the north side of the pool space with a big wall of glass that we'll see in the renderings so that we connect up to an outdoor flexible event space. We have a concrete pad there at number seven for the outdoor stage, uh, a flexible turf area that can spill out into the soccer fields, um, and that all goes to this north plaza so that the community can have types of events as we talk to the team. They had all sorts of interesting ideas about, hey, if you're having a concert there in the park, you could pipe that music into the pool. You could be watching fireworks from the pool. Um, you could send swim teams out there to have overflow space if you're having a competitive event. A whole lot of things got brought up. Uh, the flexibility of this scheme is really what got everybody excited and why we ended up going uh, with this as our preferred layout option. This is our floor plan. If you walk right in the center there, um, you see that little circular piece? That's sort of where the lobby is. Uh, and right at hand, you have immediate access and security control to go into the pool space directly straight up northward into the locker rooms and all your support, uh, upper right into the gymnasium for rec use, and then right here on the right-hand side is the rec staff with direct observation of the lobby and the entry to the pool in the front door, which was a nice place for them all to live because they're very engaged with all the activities that are going on in the building. Big picture, we have uh, about 12,500 square feet of indoor aquatics, that gymnasium I mentioned. Um, there's a activity room all the way on the far right. There's also a dedicated wet multipurpose room for wet activities, say if that's a swimming birthday party or something like lifeguard training that needs to be water resistant finishes. Um, all that service administration and then a lot of support and operations, all the stuff like filters and pumps, HVAC uh, and mechanical that keeps this building running. As Curtis had mentioned, one of the things that came up in addition to fun and multi-generational that was really important was making this facility be an iconic presence here in town. Um, I'd allude to the outdoor environment. I think most of us that come out here um, really enjoy the beauty of the landscape. Uh, it's quite austere, but one of the most beautiful things is the way the light plays across the surface of the stone and the landscape. Um, we look to that for inspiration, the stone ridge lines and the color of the rocks, which you see variation in the rocks. As you get closer, you see patches of oxidation. And you walk closer still and you see the little crystals and colors in the rocks uh, give a lot of variation. And the specialness of water. This is an aquatics facility. Uh, we talked about how the community of Yucca Valley was started with the first well dug in town, and that became a source of where, a place where people would come together and gather. Uh, this is an exciting idea conceptually that if we're investing in this facility, and providing aquatics and uh, water-based amenities for the community. It's another place for the community together going forward. Um, and also, just any time you come across water in the desert, there's something special about that. It's sort of mesmerizing. It draws animals. It draws people. Wherever you find water, you find life. So these were some of our guiding principles about thinking, what would make this facility feel like it really belongs in this location? So as we developed our architectural concepts, this is quite a large building, as I had said. We talked about the building being a stand-in for the local topography, something that shelters people. Uh, so you come outside, you can be sheltered by the bulk of the building or over on the sunny side when you want to. Um, this large form here of the superstructure of the building knits together the different volumes of the high bay, aquatics, and recreational spaces along with the more low bay, lower ceiling heights into this ribbon-like form that's reminiscent of the ridge lines behind as they overlap each other and as you watch the sun go throughout the day, you'll see shadows playing as one piece of the ridge lines, as well as different pieces of the building go in and out of sun and shadow. Uh, we have a variegated pattern of cement fiber panels that come in these rustic earth tones uh, in a blend that picks up the tones and color of the ridge lines in the landscape of Yucca Valley. So this feels like a monolith that's landed on the site, much like what you see out on the hills and some of the more iconic rocks associated with Yucca Valley. But then we didn't want to leave out the element of water. So here at the more pedestrian human level, the bottom 10 feet of the building, we have this water-inspired element. We have security fencing for reasons of access control, life safety, um, all those good things, right? Protecting some of the outdoor spaces. Um, we've made that into a playful element. So when you walk up to the building, you don't first think, hey, this is a fence. It actually feels as if it's a wave coming across the water. Oh, thank you. Uh, 
So we've highlighted those cool aquatic tones and actually brought them into the lobby of the building. As Brad mentioned, we're, that will be a subsequent presentation as we're developing what the interior schemes are, but the intent is for this to form a playful rhythm that drives, uh, that invites you to follow the fence line into the building um, and experience what's available to the community. As I mentioned uh, on the previous slide, one of the attractive things about the building is the coloration is meant to tie into the adjacent hills, but as you see the shadows move throughout the day, the building will look a little bit different. As sunset falls and the lights come up within, uh, the presence of water within the building should become even more prominent as you are aware of the cool tones within on the bouncing light off of the water. This is a view from the south. This is sort of your arrival entry if you're driving or walking straight north off of Little League Drive into the parking lot. As you approach the building, one of the benefits of the layout scheme that the whole team felt was the best was as you come up to the door, uh, the aquatic center is right in there. You can see some of the color right in there. As you walk in the front door, the pool is right at hand, and we really want to celebrate the presence of water there. Um, it's a little bit to the right in this image, but you also have immediate access into the gymnasium and the other amenities. So as soon as you arrive at the front door, you feel welcome. You can see staff, and you, somebody can help you find where to go, and the wayfinding is really simple and intuitive. Everything is off of that main lobby. And again, as the uh, building falls into evening, the character changes a little bit as the lighting and the interior, the glazing, the glass walls of the building become a little bit more of a dominant uh, aesthetic element. As I mentioned, one of the things we didn't realize going into this project until we really talked to the community was how important this connection to the west into the soccer fields was. It's such a heavily utilized amenity uh, when, when the sun is down or when the weather's cool. Um, People come out in droves to enjoy it. It's a great opportunity to allow that use to increase the use of the new rec center um, and aquatic center and vice versa. So we started talking about how this building can act as a beacon from across the park, even though that facade does take quite a beating from sun, right? So we want to limit our, or manage our amount of glass that we put on there so we're not overburdening the uh, mechanical systems. So what we came up with was this playful pattern of openings and lighting, as well as the variegation of color on the facade. So again, it keeps that character of being a monolith, but there's a playful sense of activity across the facade that's inviting. And as you get a little closer, there are a couple of larger openings that allow you to walk right up and peek in from the park. So if you're there on the side of the soccer fields, enjoying some of these amenities that we've put there so you can sit and watch a game, uh, you're also given the opportunity to walk up and look into the building, see what's going on, see the water within. Uh, there's something inherently magnetic about that that can attract the community to get curious, which is really what we want. We want them to come in and start engaging with the programs that are there. This is a view from across Bram Park in the evening, and it illustrates some of that playful element on the facade, as well as the location, uh, the pad for relocation of the stage for community events on that flexible space. We cut a slice right through the building looking into the pool. This gives you a little glimpse of what it's starting to feel like. You can see that there's an extensive glass wall on that north side where solar orientation is more favorable. We don't have to worry about overheating the building um, when the summer sun is hot in the afternoon. And we'll show that from the outside, but this is our pool layout, which we developed. We went through quite a few options on this, trying to drill down on what's the best balance of amenities and opportunity versus uh, flexible free swim water and swim class instruction. If we're looking at the very bottom of that pool out, layout there where there's some curves, we have a zero depth entry, like a beach entry for little kids so they can walk in. That's a location for amenities like these small tot slides, uh, the water sprayers, um, really geared towards young kids in particular. As we go towards the center, there's this rectangular piece, we call that the tunnel. Um, that's all at a four and a half foot depth, or excuse me, at a three and a half foot depth, 42 inch depth for swim instruction. It also gives us more real estate in terms of wall space. That's really useful for swim classes to have those walls to go back and forth from. We also have an opportunity for a basketball hoop there, some additional steps as a secondary entry. And then at the north is a competition pool that provides the capacity to hold a competitive swim meet. We also have future planning for other amenities that can go in there. Uh, infrastructure for a future water slide. Uh, we're also looking at uh, 
hardpoint connections in the pool and on the walls for things like slack lines, um, volleyball nets, these are called wibbits, inflatable recreational items, all giving the idea, the ability to connect different pieces of equipment as you acquire them over the years or have different vendors, it gives you the flexibility to introduce all sorts of different fun things and especially take advantage of that big competition space that's a lot of water that when you're not doing competitive swim or lap swim, you can start to introduce some of these elements and have even more fun. Just wanted to jump in here on that layout. Um, you'll recollect that the community advisory group, when they brought a, uh, their initial recommendation to the council, it was for an indoor aquatics space, gymnasium, as well as an outdoor competition pool. Going through that evaluation process as a staff level, uh, just looking at it both functionally and financially, the ability to support two bodies of water in indoor, outdoor, is not feasible for this town at this time and probably not in the near future or even in the in intermediate future. So uh, what we did, one of the modifications that we did was the initial concept layout had, I think had four lanes in the pool in, in the interior space for the natatorium piece. So we said, well, if we just bring this in and, and increase it to six lanes, we can pick up almost every program activity that would have occurred on the outside pool, uh, bring it inside. Um, in our design conversations, we had the ability to uh, meet with the uh, Yuck Valley High School swim coach uh, and athletic director, and both of them gave us their input. Uh, when they saw this layout, super excited. Uh, they were really excited about not only the main body of water, but also that middle body of water. It provides them some additional flexibility in how their swimmers use the program. So. Um, this facility will accomplish a number of different objectives uh, and be able to do so with just the one body of water, even though this one is inside, which obviously makes that envelope much more costly in, in capital costs. But I wanted just to highlight that uh, the assumption here is that there is no outdoor pool in the, in the either near or intermediate term uh, with, this, with this concept. We've also discussed there are a number of uh, structures that we may want to, in the future, have come off of the roof structure. So we're also looking to make sure we have the hard points and structural connections so that you really have a lot of different flexibility. Because there's a lot of fun products and vendors out there that as this community evolves um, and you want to do something different, there's lots of opportunities to accommodate it within this space. I mentioned that big glass wall on the north. This is a view standing in that outdoor flexible event space that's created at the very northern end of our project site. As you can see, there's here a really nice visual connection into that pool space, into the natatorium space itself, as well as a flexible outdoor plaza that is open for things like pop-up tents, events, and vendors, should you want to do so. And this is another view a little closer, gives you a view really maximizes that view from the outdoor event space into the plaza and into the pool beyond and vice versa. We do have, it's a big building on the east and north sides. The building is relatively economical, right? We make heavier use of CMU block. That's an extremely durable and rugged surface that we can use. It'll stand up a long time to the elements. It's also our primary structural and lateral support system for the building. So there are structural CMU walls throughout the building that essentially are holding the building up. As Curtis had mentioned, we did go through a pretty extensive process um, iterating the planning of the building, but we also did some iterations on the exterior expression of the building to try to make sure we found something that fit the best with the vision of Yucca Valley. I'll give you a brief rundown. Uh, one of the things we looked at is as I discussed, the specialness of water in the desert. What if we take that idea a little farther and we talk about this idea of the building as an oasis? Um, there are a number of different programmatic elements, but um, certainly aquatics has emerged as sort of the star of the show, I think, um, due to both its size and the uniqueness of just water in the desert and everybody wants to have fun in the pool. Um, and as we talked about what, what sort of signifies water, one is the idea of kind of the wave and that shape, but also the physics of water, when you see surface tension, leads to things like droplets and bubbles, um, this idea of a round shape. It's sort of a classic motif of water. Um, what if the building really started to accentuate that and move a little bit away from the uh, 
previous scheme. Uh, so we looked at ways to perforate the facade uh, and make it sort of a glowing beacon within the community um, and really play up this idea of bubble and wave as a motif. Um, so that in the evening, as we would light up the building, you would get sort of this glowing idea that really shouted water, you know, above all else, um, really refreshing and cool tones on the building, um, as well as expressing that motif on the western facade as well. Along with a variety of shade structures and other treatments that we might use uh, to accentuate the site on this side. For this alternative concept B, uh, again, we took a different tack in this case, and we looked at some of these classic ideas of architecture out here in the high desert, very simple modernist volumetric forms, and the, really the beauty comes from texture. And when you look at the desert, the interplay of light and shadow uh, that you notice the longer you spend out in the landscape, particularly with the vegetation out here, uh, the yuccas themselves and the cactus, uh, the way these cast dappled light um, so, and this sort of pop of color that comes at you is very unexpected when you're out in the desert. Um, so again, this expression is fairly classic and modernist in expression. Um, the volumes are expressed very simply and we rely more heavily on pops of color and the textural quality of these metal screens which provide both shading during the day um, and can light up more like a beacon or a lantern at night. And we explored what that might mean from the other side of the building with a sort of a larger super graphic uh, and sort of a cleaner, simpler, modernist aesthetic on this side of the building. And this is the view, again, from the soccer fields um, as you're getting towards the north of the fields here, looking at that big west-facing wall, which is another great sort of identity for the building. So in summary, that's our schematic design process as we've gone through all these concepts. As you can see, sort of, as I mentioned, moving from right to left, we started very loose, very open, exploring the possibilities of what maybe we didn't know about your goals and what you were trying to accomplish. Um, as we progress through, things start to get more and more realistic. We drive more things like structure and mechanical and resolution into it, um, emerging with a preferred organizational scheme that everybody agreed was the best, uh, and then a number of architectural resolutions of that that give a little bit different expression and flavor for this building in the landscape. So on the next slide, uh, is again, going back to that initial uh, slide that you saw at the beginning of the presentation, this is the final recommended schematic design package uh, before you this evening. Um, we have just a couple of other uh, overview slides. On the next slide, uh, this is again, both the kind of daytime and evening look of the final recommended schematic design Really excited about this uh, for this for this community for the long term. I'm going to have uh, Jordan just run over this. Uh, we will highlight that this uh, on the budget side. We'll be coming back to the council for a full discussion on budget. There's so many unknowns at this point, uh, but I'll let Jordan just kind of walk through what this uh, is presenting. Sure. So presented for you at the very top is the remaining Prop 68 grant funds. So at the completion of the schematic design uh, that you see here, HMC provided a cost estimate from their estimators. And then that was also compared from uh, Dolan's cost estimators. And town staff received a very detailed report of everything that would be included to build the building as of that day. So it was detailed and we were able to reconcile that to the available funds from Prop 68 and then additional funding that the town has acquired. So I just wanted to highlight that those uh, about 19 million is still available of Prop 68 funds. And of that, we currently have the HMC contract and the Dolan contract. And then the higher of the two cost estimates that were provided was that 27 million number there. Um, I did just want to highlight that there's contingencies in the design phase, there's contingencies in the construction phase, and then there's also an overall project contingency. So those would be used as design decisions are made, and um, those are certain percentages of the total project cost right now. So you would see those drawn down as, as necessary and not necessarily see uh, the total project or construction cost go up over that process within the next six months. Um, and then the the next estimate would be at design completion. And as Curtis mentioned, we would go review budget, I think in the next several council meetings here so that you can really see what budget would be available. Thank you, Jordan. Next slide. 
Um, John, you want to talk to, uh, through this on the milestones here? Yeah. So what we reviewed is that first bar, that schematic design, that's really determining how much of what we're going to build, um, where it goes on the site, how it relates to each other. So this really sets us on track to take that first estimate and get the quantities of what we're suggesting. Um, we wrapped that up in early May. That's the basis of this presentation. Um, in an effort to keep on track and on schedule, we've been continuing with the design development. That's a more detailed look at systems, the structural system, the mechanical system, and all the way down to uh, what fixtures and maintenance items the town wants to see, as well as the further development of the interior spaces, the interior design of the building. We've been progressing ahead with that. We have several more weeks of that before we get into construction documents. That's when we start basically producing the final documents that reflect what we would be bidding and constructing once we pinned all this stuff down in construction documents. Uh, that would go back for town approval. We'd be looking at bidding an award in early 2023 uh, with construction all that year and close out in mid-2024. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, on the next slide. So before we go to public comment and then council questions, I'd like to have Stephanie come up and just talk from the project manager's viewpoint on both challenges and successes that we've had to, to date and any other thoughts you want to provide. Thanks, sure. Stephanie. Absolutely. It is great to see you all again. Um, I hope you're excited by what you've seen on the screen today. So as Curtis mentioned, it's been a really great collaborative process as a team. And I want to say we're one team both the town staff and the design team, and myself as project manager. So if you think of an iceberg, you've all seen that graphic of an iceberg where you only actually see the top 10% and the rest of it's buried. The 90% of the iceberg is buried underwater and you never see it. It's really similar to what you're seeing up here. This is probably a summary of the 10% of the effort that the entire team has put in. Over five months, we've come this far, and that's fantastic. And the team has been working very diligently to maintain deadlines and hit milestones. And it's been a really rigorous process. Curtis had mentioned we're meeting at least twice a week, if not more than that, um, to make decisions, to, to determine what the priorities are, and to really carve out balance. And I think that's been the biggest challenge thus far finding that balance, the balance of needs versus wants, the balance of priorities versus budget concerns, um, the balances of programs and future desires. And the town team has been fantastic at really limiting those down and creating both a want list and a, and a would like to have list down the road. And I've been very specific with them about that. Um, again, very rigorous process, probably a bit demanding, and that's probably me being more demanding than anything on the team. Um, but it's been a process of challenging each other and validating all our decisions as we make them. So I think it's been fantastically successful and all with the goal of creating the best facility for the town and the community. So looking forward, biggest challenges are going to be two things that we really don't have too much control over, to be honest, and that's going to be market and supply chain issues. And both of those impact both budget and timing for the town and this project. So. What Jordan put up there, you, when she put the budget up there, she noted contingencies. Contingencies are a huge number right now because of that fluctuation in the market. Supply chain issues are gonna become a problem, so we as a, as a team are already discussing ways to mitigate some of those time delays, um, looking at different procurement methods. So Curtis, Shane, the rest of the team, we're gonna be discussing those in the months to come to try to both gain back a little bit of time and probably, hopefully, save us some money in the long run. Um, knowing what challenges are ahead of us and knowing how the team's functioned thus, well, uh, thus far, and it's been functioning very well, we have no doubt that we're going to be able to hit the, the deadlines and the milestones that have been put up here thus far. And at each one, Dolan will be doing a peer review, and we also have our secondary cost estimate or second set of eyes on any cost estimate that comes through. Mm. Happy to answer any questions. Well, that concludes our uh, presentation for you this evening. After public comment, we'd be happy to answer any other questions. Thank you. Great presentation. Um, anybody in the public, any members of the public in the room want to comment on this? Seeing none, anybody online? OK, we'll bring it back to the council who wants to lead it off. Council Member Abel? 
Well, first of all, thank you so very, very much. I, I love uh, the design. I love the thought that goes behind it. I love that you talked about life cycle cost issues and so forth. Um, so again, um, you know, we really appreciate you putting in all of our thoughts and wants and wishes and, and goals uh, and most in the most practical package possible that we have within our budgets. Um, I do love your uh, initial uh, concept A. I think that really does uh, really address the feel and the artsiness of Yucca Valley. Um, the other two designs were nice, but that, I thought those were better for another community. You know, and I thought the first design had a lot of thought, a lot of uh, a lot of the uh, the elements of of the nature and so forth. And and uh, I'm hoping the other public agencies out here, if they have large buildings and projects, will hire your firm to go through the very thoughtful process that I've heard tonight. So, excellent, excellent job. Um, the uh, the the design and so forth. Um, I'm, I'm assuming, as you've worked with our staff, we're dealing with maintenance and and also um, practical things of natural lighting instead of having to use lighting during the day. If we could use natural light to to illuminate the pool area or parts of the gym and so forth without overheating the box, overheating the the facility. Uh, but otherwise, I think it's just uh, fantastic. Uh, I know that. Uh, uh, the issues of unknown costs and, and getting projects done on time are, are really rough, but I'm hoping perhaps there's a slowdown in the economy and maybe some of these uh, other projects are going to come to a halt and ours can move th forward with more favorable prices. So uh, that's my, my wish. But thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed the concepts. Mayor Pro Tem. Oh, thank you. you go? Uh, first, I'd like to just mentioned that I, I liked the repetitive comment that um, the team works well together. So we have diff brought different people together. Uh, you work a lot uh, with our, uh, our executive management team in many ways and, and others that are, that are here to, in attendance today too. So that was kind of an overarching theme and I think that's why the production seems to go so well and flow so well. Uh, I also agree that as I looked through the proposals earlier and quite a few times, uh, option A just stuck out to me very well to fit uh, the, the theme and the feel of our community. So thank you for doing that. But I didn't disregard the other uh, uh, designs that you had brought forward. I thought that was really nice to give us an opportunity to look at it. They do fit different communities. They just weren't, I think, the best fit for this one. Uh, some of the colors were maybe a little too industrial, uh, but the first one is a little more of a, a desert tone in those, those colors. Um, one thing that you brought up was uh, paying attention to the cost of operation and maintenance, and that was a very important piece for us. Uh, the community, this will be a long project, and we want to make sure that we can keep it within uh, uh, an easy and manageable cost you know, to operate it efficiently. Um, I'm, I'm on a few other boards, and I'm, under, I'm pretty aware of contingencies, and recent, it's normally about 10% of the build is, uh, has been traditional, and I'm seeing now that they go as high as 30%. So I also appreciate that you're looking at that, that you're understanding that we have to be prepared for those kinds of things to occur. Um, there was one thing I liked. Someone mentioned the slack line. I saw that in some of the pictures, and I thought that was wonderful because my kids, when they were younger, I had to go buy them slack lines because that was just all the rage to do for a while. And they had to learn by falling on the desert ground, probably not as nice as the pool. Uh, the other part was, as was mentioned shortly, some of the other activities that uh, the center pool was going to be able to use used for. Uh, you had mentioned a slide, and I saw a slide in uh, the, the images. Is that included in the, this thought and build right now, uh, actually, the slide? Because I haven't actually seen it included, uh, but I did hear it mentioned. It just looked like so much fun. I could yeah. see myself going down at Superman style or something. Sure, yeah. Right now, the current estimate uh, covers infrastructure for the slide, so water lines and a footing okay. um, with the slide to come future. So that's the current basis of design. So that's kind of a teaser in the picture to show us our, the future of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's something right. that we want to get that infrastructure under the deck before we build it so you Absolutely. have the possibility. Yeah. All right. Thank you for clearing that up. Yeah. And that's all. Th great. I'm glad you guys are here and everything's working out well. You know, um, I'm just, I'm super excited. This is, this is quite, a, quite a project. And the timeline looks very... Uh, uh, palatable. I like that. It looks like it accelerates towards the end. Construction projected to be under a year. So it looks good. Council Member Droz. I just want to say thank you. And uh, I agree with the recommended uh, project design. I think it looks really wonderful. Um, 
this is a great introduction to the project. Of course, we're we'll beginning to do a lot more stuff later. But I do want to say I appreciate your thoughtfulness of the desert vibe, the way you tried to match all the designs to different aspects of the desert. It's like you, uh, you really researched that well. And uh, I don't know, are any of you desert dwellers or visitors, or were you before this? Well, uh, we spend a lot of time visiting. My, my in-laws have a house just up the road. So, oh, okay, yeah, okay. So I, well, he spends a lot of time out here too, but yeah, I come out here a lot to climb and visit my in-laws, so yeah. Well, it seems like you caught a lot of the, uh, the things that locals really notice about the desert. So I don't know if you learned that or you've been around for a while. It sounds like you have, so. Anyway, thank you very much. I'm really pleased with this. Councilmember Lombardo. Well, I don't know why everybody's not jumping out of their seats. This is really <laughs> exciting. I, I, we've waited a long time to have a municipal pool in the town. We ha had one that we shared with the high school, and um, <clears throat> it's out, we've outgrown it. We're ready for something new, and I love the idea. The, the design is, is iconic, is the way I would describe it. It's going to be beautiful 50 years from now. And uh, I like the idea of the, of the materials that you're using, the colors that you're using. Um, I'm excited about the way you, it's been laid out. I think the collaboration of so many bright minds together really is resulting in something nice here instead of just a mishmash of things. You know, you could have all the elements, but if it's not purposely put in the right place, it would be hard to use. And this just looks so wonderful. I can't wait to go jump in the pool and I can't wait to see something happen on the amphitheater and go there when they're having competition for the swimming and see all the high schools competing and using the space and setting up their little tents and camp spaces. I, I'm, I'm excited about it. I, the opportunities for the community to gather with special events and using the the areas that have been designated and just walking by will be a treat. It'll make you wanna, you know, run laps or maybe go to the gym and, and use the, the basketball courts a little more frequently because the feel of water is just so engaging here in, in the desert. Just being near a body of water makes you feel more alive. And I, I think you've really captured it. I think kudos to everybody involved and uh, to our staff for all the hard effort and work and, and collaboration. It's what it's all about. It's why we have such a special community. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, I'm kind of looking forward to seeing Council Member Lombardo jump in the pool. Yeah. <laughs> he will. I've gone down slides before. Yeah. I think uh, the, uh, parks, at, at, was it Paradise Park? We I appreciate the, the <laughs> I appreciate the enthusiasm for the project uh, on the design team and staff and and the council as well. It, it feels good to be committed to this project. Uh, I remember early conversation with uh, Assemblyman Mays when he, he first secured the money, uh, the grant money for this project. Uh, he did say that um, iconic was one of the words, architecturally significant was, was the other uh, term that he used in describing uh, what he envisioned for this community. And I think, I think that's, uh, you're presenting that pretty well, uh, that, that vision. Um, I do uh, echo the comments of the other council members. I don't need to go through those again. I do like uh, uh, the, uh, the way this has been well thought out uh, so far along the way and the collaboration, I uh, appreciate that and actually proud of the whole team uh, for, for, uh, for that effort. Um, do kind of look forward to seeing what the shade is gonna look like. That would be the one comment I had on that design on the west side where the uh, soccer fields are. Just, uh, just kind of seems like we need shade over there, but uh, that was the only, the only thing that stuck out to me. Um, and, and the driveway, I did have a, a need a clarification on the driveway. The driveway is going to go around to the north all the way out to the street out there at, at Palm. Is that right? So it's going to be, you can drive all the way through. Is that right? Okay. Um, yeah, so, and I uh, fully appreciate the candor regarding the budget. I know that's a pretty, pretty difficult issue to talk about right now, but, uh, and um, I appreciate the candor and appreciate the effort of the team. So with that, uh, is this a receive and file? 
Okay, so we don't need a, a motion on that, but any other comments, Council, we good? I'd, I'd like to remind the, the team that in 1955, Disneyland cost 16 million. <laughs> I appreciate also that uh, there's so many stakeholders involved with the uh, competition element with the, the uh, pool. Uh, we don't have a pool that could hold a CIF type of meet uh, now here in Yucca Valley, so this will have electronic timing and so forth. So you sort of filled that element that needed uh, to be done. We also have water aerobics uh, classes and so forth, so that uh, one pool to the side could de definitely be used for water aerobics or, like you said, uh, swim lessons and other things. So I love the flexibility with trying to do a whole lot in a small building. Uh, my question is, do you, does this project remind you of any other facilities that you've recently built, uh, size and scope? Well, I would say in one area, it doesn't remind me of anything we've done because it is so unique to Yucca. I think that's one of the unique things we've challenged ourselves with is to create a facility. And I, and I, I think it was even Curtis and staff who pushed us to say, let's look at different options to really confirm in our minds we're doing the right thing. And I think as we did that, we found like our first thought and all the creativity that John brought about being very iconic and regional really emphasized itself as we went through that. So. The elements, yes, we've done pools that are indoors. We know all the technical issues of dealing with corrosion, dealing with fresh air, those things. I, we were just talking this morning about often you'll walk into a YMCA pool and you'll open the door and a burst of hot, humid air that smells like horrible chlorine hits you. Uh, the last pool we did that was an indoor pool doesn't do that because we've learned all the things, how to manage air, how to manage the corrosion, the, the chlorine. So. There will be a little bit of that, which we completely recognize, but I think what you have is also a very unique facility. I think, like you said, I, we would really love that other company, other jurisdiction around would come to us to build buildings for them, too, as you, <laughs> we would love that, so. They'll all want one once they see this yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's, it's awesome how you. It's, it's very unique, and yeah. so. Yeah, I think that'll it'll be beneficial to you too because it's uh, it's something that's unique for your portfolio. So you can say this is what we can do, and we can really make it customized for the community that you live in. So it'll it'll be a win-win. You know, we win by your your thinking outside the box and, and uh, incorporating these elements, but then also you know you guys will win because of receiving the contract, but also having something in the portfolio that you can be proud of. So. Um, we're looking forward to giving other communities tours of the facility once it's done too, so. I think it's wonderful how you've managed the hot that we have here and the cold that we experience here with the wind. Uh, the design really accommodates all that beautifully, I think, and, and yet it's gonna look beautiful. It had a lot of constraints, you know, a lot of things you had to deal with, but I, it turned out really beautiful, turning out. My okay. kids will be in the pool every time they come to visit Grandpa. They will want to go in the pool. So. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thanks again for the report. Awesome presentation. Swim party at our place. Yeah. <laughs> Swim party. We will move along to item number 20, the animal care and control presentation and report. Mayor and Council, Doug Smith, animal care and control manager, will provide the council with uh, the annual report following uh, public comment. Uh, Doug will be available to answer any questions. Let's see if I can get this right. Point it. You guys? There we go. Uh, Mayor and Council, well, I'd like to thank you for having me at the meeting tonight. Um, just give you a little bit of an overview of the Animal Care and Control Program. It's broken down to three sections the field services, shelter services, and administrative services sections. Um, just a quick overview of all of them. I'm going to start with the field services side of it. We provide field services to the residents and businesses of the town limits. Business hours for us normally are Monday through Friday from 8 to 5. We can be reached at 760-365-1807. Other than business hours, Saturdays, Sundays, holidays, after hours, uh, we get our calls dispatched to the Sheriff's Department and we respond to priority calls typically. Um, some calls we do receive that are carried over to the next business day that don't quite qualify for an immediate response, but do need to be addressed. And I'm kind of looking, normally for this presentation, I do a uh, what we've done in the past year. This time I want to look at like a five-year spread so you can kind of see how we were doing before COVID, 
as we're coming through COVID and now as we're coming out of COVID, you can kind of see what our responses are. Um, you can see that during COVID when it hit, our number of calls kind of dipped a little bit. Uh, and now our service calls are starting to pick up just a little bit again. Uh, on the shelter side of it, uh, we provide sheltering for the not only the town limits, but also the surrounding unincorporated communities. This is done on a contractual basis between the county and the town. And on the sheltering side of it, you can see that when COVID hit, our numbers took a dip as well. Uh, dogs and cats both dipped. And as we're coming out of it, you're seeing it starting to pick up a little bit again. We're still not back where we normally thought we would be, um, but we are seeing some increases year over year that are expected for us. Not only do we pick up dogs and cats, but we also deal with other animals such as exotics, large livestock, wild animals, small livestock, uh, such as that. And you can see those numbers on the bottom. You can also see how they dipped a little bit through the process as well. Uh, before I move on with the presentation, I just want to give you a little bit of information. Um, in state law, they've, they have, state law has given us guidelines, or a mandate rather, of what an adoptable animal is. And it's codified in two different sections of code, both the Food and Agriculture Code and in the Penal Code. And those basically are eight weeks of animals which are eight weeks of age or older that have demonstrated no sign of a behavior or temperamental in the turn in the law they call it a defect that would pose a health or safety risk or otherwise make the animal unsuitable as placement as a pet and have manifested no sign of disease, injury, congenital or hereditary condition that ad adversely affects the animal's health or is likely to affect the animal's health in the future. That's the basic guideline we use when we determine what's adoptable, what's not adoptable. Now, previously I've showed you the intake numbers and those are listed up on the tops. This slide is specific to dogs. There are four basic ways an animal can leave the shelter. It's either return to its owner or RTO, adopted to a new permanent home, transferred to another shelter or to a partnered animal rescue group or euthanasia. Now the shelter uses when we determine adoptability, we're looking at three different aspects of it. We are looking at the animal's temperament, how it interacts with people as well as other animals, how the animal, um, the health of the animal, and lastly, it'd be population control of the shelter. Now, in the time I've been employed by the town, which has been roughly almost seven years, we've, had, we've only had to use the population control aspect twice. We typically are okay using the behavioral aspect of it or the health aspect of it and maintaining a healthy shelter, healthy population, and able to find suitable homes for the pets. And one thing I do want to show on here is the return to animal rate, the RTO rate, that generally stays in the 20 to, you know, almost touching 30% range. We had a good year in 2019. Um, the adoptions dropped in 2020 due to the pandemic, but if you look at our transfers, we were able to transfer those numbers up to partnered rescue groups or to other shelters, which offset the um, number of animals that were remaining at the shelter. Our euthanasia number, that generally maintains in about the low to mid 20 section. Um, and those are animals that typically have behavioral issues that don't meet the criteria for placement without placement out of the shelter into a permanent home. Now, if a rescue group, the way the law is written, if a rescue group does want one of the animals we have deemed as not adoptable, they partner with us. They have to be a 501c3 rescue nonprofit organization, and they're allowed to take the animal from us. And the only criteria we have for them is within 30 days of them taking the animal, they have to provide us with a spay or neuter certificate on the animal and then they are, would be the ones that would place the animal in the public, not directly through us. Now shifting gears just a little bit over to the cat side, the cat's return to owner rate is typically in the two to 3% range, and that's pretty common year over year. The adoption rate fluctuates a little bit year over year. Transfers, it all depends who has what space available and who is willing to accept animals in. Generally, when we get a huge intake of cats, 
they're seeing the same thing on their side, so it's a little tricky trying to find enough homes for everybody. Uh, the euthanasia rate, while it does seem high when you look at the slides, you have to realize those are the feral, unsocialized, and the neonate cats that have come to the shelter that don't meet that definition of adoptability that we try to find a rescue group for, but we can't place back out with the public. But, the sh but through the pandemic, prior to the pandemic, through the pandemic, and coming out of the pandemic, the, show, the community is still showing its support, and we're still getting a lot of donated towels and blankets and you know treats for the animals and like that, that the public is still supporting the shelter. Is even as everything else around us is changing, um, they're still showing their support for us. Lastly, we have the administrative services section. They take care of the fisc fiscal aspects, the record keeping, dispatching and receiving calls from the field staff and the public. Uh, f licensing, including organizing the annual rabies clinic and our organizational adoption events and our social media. We have not had a licensing clinic in the last two years, and that's primarily due to COVID, where we don't want to have large gatherings of people showing up with their pets. What we have found is there are enough between Animal Action League, Petco, Tractor Supply, and the two providing vets in town there is ample opportunity for the public to get their animals vaccinated, and then we just do the licensing aspect of it as we do. We are planning to, hopefully the COVID numbers continue on a downward track to try to do a limited event this year, but it, it's primarily driven by COVID numbers and not trying to have large groups of people and become a spreader event. Through the pandemic, we did off, we do, well, prior to the pandemic, we had the uh, spay and neuter voucher program that the council has graciously provided uh, the donated funding for the, um, through that program. When the pandemic hit and everything closed, the veterinarians pulled back their services and were not offering spay and neuter services. So we slowed that down and actually suspended the program for about eight months. And then once they started offering those services again, we again started issuing out vouchers to the public. What we have found is there is a backlog for people trying to get spay and neutered animals. And so our vouchers are good for 90 days. And so we're trying to time those with the appointments. I know one provider uh, currently is booking appointments about eight months out for spay and neuter surgeries. So we're, yeah, so we're trying to coordinate the issuing of the vouchers to get them in that time window to get it done so that we can still maintain some feasibility of control over the program and not just have vouchers sitting out everywhere at once and, and you know having problems that way. We do have four providers for our program. A VCA uh, is a provider. Companion Animal Hospital provides services to us. Animal Action League does it. And for very large animals or unique cases, uh, we call them smush nosed dogs like pugs and such as that, that the local providers, um, animal actually won't provide services for those types of animals. We also partnered with the Humane Society of San Bernardino who will provide those services as well. And so they can go a little bit out of the area, but since most of our, our community may be commuting in that direction anyways, drop off in the morning, pick them up in the afternoon on the way by. In closing, I just want to express my thanks to the council for the continued support to the program. The staff as well thanks the council for their support. And the, it's a, the community shows their support by the donations of stuff to, to the shelter. And they, show, they come to the shelter and a lot of times it's, I'm just here to look around. And so we take them out, show them the pets that are available for adoption, answer all their questions, and uh, go from there. So with that... Madam Council, just a couple other comments, if I may. When you saw the statistics for uh, the dog category, you have a 70 to 75 percent return to owner adoption and transfer, uh, primarily to rescue groups. That is an extremely high number, probably one of the highest that you'll find in most public shelters. So I think that's uh, an indication of the commitment that your staff at the shelter has and that they make to. Uh, uniting the animals that come into our shelter with their new forever home. And so I just want to say thank you to Doug and his staff for those efforts. 
Number two, I want to recognize Doug um, for the period of around July through December of 2021. We had some transition. We had some transition at the shelter, which uh, resulted in Doug working. I'm just going to call it out essentially seven days a week, being the only field officer that's available, having to fill in at the shelter for shelter staff that was missing. And um, during that time period, Doug stepped up and did a yeoman's job when we were missing a lot of positions. Um, it was very difficult and Doug's commitment came through during that time period. So I just wanted to mention that this evening and thank Doug again for those efforts uh, during that time period. This will, that concludes my part of the presentation and I'll be open for questions after public comment. Okay, thank you, Doug. Uh, does any, any member of the public want to comment on this item? Seeing none, anybody online? No, bring it back to the council. Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, thank you, Doug, for that. Um, I'm up in that area quite regularly now and I'll have to say that uh, the shelter there is a very quiet place. Right around feeding time, you know that there's a little activity, uh, but it's, it's just a sign of what's going on over there and you treat the animals well. Thank you. Uh, just a couple questions. Uh, uh, for recovery of, of pets that get disconnected somehow, uh, what's the highest time of year for those services in our area? It, it fluctuates. There are times when we will have a lot of intakes come in and the owners are right behind them to claim them. And there's other times when our intakes kind of drop off a little bit. Um, as the weather tends to get very warm, we seem to see less animals coming in. Animals are pretty smart. They realize when it's very cold, they want to stay in where it's warm. And when it's very hot, they want to stay in where it's cool. So during those other times of the year when the weather's more temperate, that's when they tend to go out and we see more activity on their side. Okay, so quite a mix. On, uh, on the, uh, the return to owner dogs, are, are, do you get some that appear to have owners, but we're not just able to connect them back again? Is that common or is that something we could try and improve in the community through outreach? I would say 90 plus percent of the animals that have come into the shelter, 95 percent plus, there is an owner somewhere for them. But it may be a situation where based upon the dog's behavior or the dog's health that the owner has said, I've broken that obligation. Okay. And I just, they don't want, they don't respond anymore. Because I know you see uh, just recently in, in uh, my daughter's neighborhood, you know, these dogs and you know they belong somewhere and, and they're nice dogs, but somehow they get disconnected by the time I'm out to reach them. It's difficult to get them back uh, to your service that has a few more tools to reconnect them. And I'd just like to see that uh, work, but, but your numbers are very, very good. Um, I'll have to say also just to shout out, I've used a, a companion animal clinic and it's been challenging through COVID and I understand how that bottleneck happens. The process to get our pets into these facilities like that in Animal Action League has been very difficult, but they continue like you to, to work through it. It's just a much slower process lately. And I'm sure that greatly affects you and the services that you try and have. It impacts us because we have a limited, they, they limit us to generally two or three days with a certain number of animals that we can bring in of the adoptable ones that have been spared to get spay or neutered. And so we're always stacking those animals up and that list is constantly in flux because we may, we may have a list of animals that are not adopted yet, that those are the next projected animals to go and as stuff is changing on that list, they get inserted in, other animals get pulled off but we try to get everybody in as quickly as possible. Our goal is to get as many animals spay and neuter as we can so when the public comes in and selects a pet to be adopted, they can walk it out the door that same day. Yeah, eight months is uh, quite, a, quite a length. Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned uh, all kinds of animals. Can you just tell me what the strangest animal is that you've brought into the, into the shelter? <laughs> I'll tell you about Monday. Okay. Yesterday. <laughs> Yesterday we picked up an injured sheep and then oh. we got a peahen in at the shelter all in the same day. So it's just kind of unique wow. that, that stuff would come in like that. We've had horses that we've impounded, but we impound those to a third party facility. Um, but we, continue, we count those in our statistics because they are technically under our control. And we've had them that have gotten away from Black Rock and wandered down into the homes and we've walked them into the uh, equestrian center to be held. Mm -hmm. We've had other ones that have gotten loose in the middle of the night. This horse actually lived over on La Contena, I'm sorry, on Yucca, Yucca Mesa and it got chased from the Walmart parking lot up in up Highway 247 into one of the homes. So 
at two o'clock in the morning. Oh, so wow. oh, it's, well. a, it's the danger factor is always there for us yeah. because in the middle of the night you're not expecting to see a loose horse on Highway 247 in front of you. Not at all. So we respond and we take appropriate action to protect the health of the safety of the public as well as we need to protect the animals. Well, thanks for taking good, such good care. Thank you. Appreciate it. Councilmember Doves. I just want to say thank you for everything you do. I know personally of your dedication and because uh, I've dealt with you before and uh, I know you're very dedicated and your and your staff is too. So thank you very much. Councilmember Lombardo. Thank you, Doug. Um, this facility that you're operating out of is uh, one that was also designed by architects and it's meeting all your needs and expectations at this point. Yes, it is. We were really proud of that facility when we built it, and I, I am glad to hear that it's maintaining its usefulness. Um, I thank you for your dedication and, and the extra work that you've been putting in to fill in the gaps when uh, the other staff were not present, and uh, it just it's a good testament to your uh, love of your job and your dedication to the animals and to the community. Thank you very much. Going off of your comment, it's not unusual for the public to come into the shelter and open the doors. And one of the things they say is, you have a beautiful facility. Yeah. And that's a testament to, that's a testament to uh, all the thought that went into it when it was built and designed. It was a big deal when it happened. And it was really nice of the county to partner with us to make it feasible. It was uh, that collaboration once again in Yucca Valley. It worked out well. Thank you. Council Member Abel. Yeah, uh, Doug, uh, thank you again for coming and working for our town. How many years now has it been since you've been here? Seven years. Oh, my goodness. It just it just seemed like yesterday when you were coming on board, and, yeah. and I, I know it's been a few years. So we're really glad that you have, uh, you've you come and added your expertise to our community, and you've done a great job, and seven years is, is a good investment that we made in you. So thank you for that. Um, I had a couple questions. Um, do you send out reminder notices? Uh, because I'm thinking that... Uh, uh, my dog, I wanted to make sure it was, you know, licensed and so forth. And then it's probably, my wife probably let it lapse in the... Uh, yeah, yeah, it's all the wife's And uh, so I wanted to make sure I... Do you send out reminder notices like I do from the, the DMV reminds me to, to register again? That is one of the functions of admin services within the program is they send out several hundred notices every month that your licenses do. Generally, they go out about a month and a half in advance to give people the opportunity to get the appointment if they do need to be revaccinated of their animal and then to purchase their dog license. So yes, those do go out and that's a function of that one section of the program. Okay, I'll have to double check to make sure my dog's in compliance and so forth. Um, um, why is such a low uh, return to owner rate on, on cats? Is it just because they figured the cat's gone or missing or uh, just because of uh, not that many owners perhaps lose their, their, their pet and it's the stray cats that you get? The, the majority that we're seeing are the stray cats coming in. Um, we do have some people that come in and they claim their pets right, their cats right off. Generally, cats tend to stay at home and if there's a problem, the owner generally knows that there's a problem in the neighborhood with their cat and it gets addressed. Uh, it's the stray cats that come in. Um, other shelters that I've worked for in the past, it's a very low uh, return to owner rate on cats as well. It's just, that's kind of the nature of it. Okay. And uh, you had mentioned um, that uh, you still receive donations and so forth from the public, which is fantastic. Uh, what are the donations that you don't need any more of and what are the donations that you really use? We get donations of like dog treats, you know, milk bones, stuff like that. Those are great for the animals. Those are great to keep them stimulated. Staff goes out there, gets them on a leash, uses as a, as a uh, training, you know, treat for the animal. Uh, we go through a ton of blankets and towels at the shelter. Uh, some of the pets, you, you will see when some of the pets come in, you will lay their, their towel out for them or their blanket out for them. And when you come in the next morning, it is exactly how you left it the day before. And there are others who are in there who think it's the giant chew toy and just shred it. But we'll give them a fresh one the next day to start all over again with. Um, so it's blankets and towels we use a ton of, and the treats, it's stuff like that. So you don't have an overabundance of people just giving you towels all the time and you don't need any more. You need, all donations are really open and accepted. That's true. All donations are open and accepted because I never want to tell somebody no, 
on a donation, we have a whole laundry room because everything that comes in, we wash and dry before you ever give, ever give it to a pet. And so that room is constantly being used in flux. And as stuff gets used over time, if it blanket gets a hole in it, we you know discard it. And we put a fresh one out again for the pet because we want to make sure that they're well taken care of as best we can. Okay, fantastic. And you don't want them to encourage to continue to eat it and have medical issues and so forth. Truth. All right. Well, thank you so very much. Appreciate that. Yeah, thanks for the presentation, Doug. We had a chance to uh, chat this morning at the coffee. <clears throat> excuse me, the coffee with the mayor, and I learned a few things. But it's in, it's uh, comforting to know that the shelter is functioning the way that it should. You know, after all these years, uh, that it's uh, functioning well. And um, also wanted to share that that Doug uh, shared with the group about the uh, uh, animal care and controls preparation for emergencies in case of earthquake, fire, and so forth, that they're all trained and continue to train for uh, any emergencies that come up uh, with the animal component. And uh, it's uh, uh, pretty impressive how they, how they are prepared to, to respond, not just every day to everyday stuff, but also in case of an emergency. So um, yeah, I appreciate the, appreciate the report. And is this a receive and file? Okay, so thanks again, Doug. Thank you very much, happy night. Okay, moving on to item number 21, 2022 San Bernardino County Point and Time Final Report. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, the item before you is an overview of the final report for the 2022 Point and Time Count. Uh, the Town of Yucca Valley participated in the 2022 Point in Time Count and Subpopulation Survey to gather a one-day snapshot in time that identifies the number of unhoused individuals within the county. This year, the number of individuals counted in Yucca Valley totaled 57, uh, representing a reduction in unsheltered individuals by 14 from the previous count that was done in 2020, uh, which is a, a decrease of 20%. Uh, the town worked alongside the city of 29 Palms along as well as local service providers to plan and execute this year's count. Approximately 21 volunteers participated in the count throughout the Moronga Basin, which instead of in January took place on February 24th, 2022. And I would personally like to express my sincere gratitude for everyone that assisted that day as it was 20 degrees when we started. So. Um, there are two organization representatives that continue to make an impact um, in supporting the community's unhoused population. The first is Astrid Johnson. Uh, she is uh, from Morongo Basin Arch, and the second is Wayne Hamilton from the Morongo Unified School District. Uh, Astrid is a retired teacher who currently serves as the president of Morongo Basin Arch. And through Morongo Basin Arch, she is instrumental and in initiates and manages food and shelter programs throughout the basin. And actually, I will give her kudos because she actually helps out even outside the basin. Um, Wayne serves as the community outreach coordinator for Morongo Unified School District. I'm sure many of you are familiar with him, uh, where he leverages school resources to connect families in need with school supplies, social services, and rental assistance. These individuals are really the boots on the ground for us with the homeless and you know, unhoused individuals, and they are greatly appreciated for all that they do in this community. So that concludes my brief staff report, and I'd be happy to answer any questions following public comment. Thank you. Any member of the public wishing to comment on this? Seeing none, anybody online? No? Com uh, council? Anybody? We're good. Thank you for the report, Deborah. Appreciate your involvement in this. Yeah, thank you, and thanks for bringing up uh, Astrid Johnson and Wayne Hamilton. It's, it's amazing what they do, tireless, the two of them. Tirelessly, I mean, really, truly, and they are always available to anyone that calls them. So. Right, yeah, they are very good at what they do. Okay, that's receive and file also. So at this point, are there any future agenda items any council members would like to see? No. No? Move on to public comments. The town council takes this time to consider your comments on items of concern which are not on the printed agenda. When you are called to speak, please state your name and community of residence. Please limit your comments to three minutes or less. 
Inappropriate behavior which disrupts, disturbs, or otherwise impedes the orderly conduct of the meeting will result in forfeiture of your public comment privileges. The town council is prohibited by state law from taking action, <clears throat> excuse me, or discussing any items not on the printed agenda. Are there any public comments? Seeing none, any online? We have one person requesting public comment, Anita Petke. You have been requested to unmute. You have three minutes. Unmute, got it. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Anita Pecky. I work for Desert Beacon. We are a short-term property management company who serves property owners in the Morongo Basin. I'm here today on behalf of one of our property owners, Lily Pablo. She submitted her STVR permit application today with the town of Yucca Valley. And here are her comments. Comments to the Council. After two years of failed home buying scenarios, I finally have a new home, I'm a new homeowner to the area. My family fell in love with Joshua Tree area after renting an Airbnb a few years ago. And we just had to be part of this amazing place, like so many. The opportunity to own a vacation home rental offset costs by listing the home as a short-term rental makes this possible for our family. In April, I called to make an appointment to drop off my short-term rental application. I was told they were booking these appointments out all the way until June. I secured a June 21st as the earliest appointment. In the meantime, I worked hard every detail of the permit application. I spent many hours researching the best property management company and utilizing them to complete my permit application. Today, I was furious to hear the permit costs have increased almost $1,000 from what it was when I scheduled the appointment back in April. I have budgeted every dollar toward my project. This has been a huge expense. This is a shakedown and it's, it's completely unfair. For those of us who secured appointments as far back as April, like myself, we should not be penalized with this rate increase while we wait for months for an appointment. This is extortion as I have already been waiting to apply and we have increased your and you have increased your rates unfairly with no consideration for my family like mine. On top of this, it also appears there's a confusion over June 1st and July 1st, and even when the magical fee increase happens, when it was clearly posted in the High Desert Star News on May 6th that the fees would go into effect July 1st, the start of the new fiscal year. My first impression to becoming part of the, the community and one where I feel shaken down and unwelcome. Please consider stories like mine withhold from increasing my permit costs for this endeavor. I have worked so hard on. Sincerely, Lily Paolo. Thank you kindly for your time, leadership, and for hearing this comment today. Thank you. Any other public comments? Seeing none, bring it back for staff reports and comments. Thank you, Mayor, <laughs> Council. Uh, Deborah Jordan, anything today? Uh, Shane, you have anything? Uh, just a couple quick items, Mayor and Council. The annual slurry seal project uh, started off last week. The contractor is out grinding as part of that project and the application of the uh, slurry seal material is scheduled to start Wednesday of next week. Planning Commission has completed their non-public hearing discussions of mural programs and revisions to the town's sign ordinance regarding murals and the Planning Commission is scheduling a public hearing for those revisions uh, at their meeting of July 12th of 2022 and if they complete their recommendations at the uh, at that July meeting then they'll be forwarding that recommendation forward to uh, the town council for your consideration and action those are my comments for this evening mayor and council thank you Shane I see Captain Niles online Captain you have anything for the council or community this evening We'll try and unmute you here in a second. There, I think that was successful. Can you hear me? Yes, you're good to go. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. First, thanks for letting Lieutenant Weebel and I join you tonight virtually. I appreciate that. Um, and I'd like both of us would like to extend our 
congratulations to Bob and to Jerry and to Megan. That's wonderful stuff tonight. And then just a, a couple quick public safety issues or, or some comments. And maybe one just piggybacking on Deborah's staff report about the point in time and our homeless issue in the community. Um, you know, uh, on top of the wonderful work all of our local civic groups and nonprofit groups do, uh, I just want to remind the council and all of our residents that uh, the Sheriff's Hope team and a member of the Department of Be Behavioral Health, who actually is working out of my office now, is here in the Morongo Basin uh, every week offering services to any individuals who find themselves living on the streets. Um, they, they've had great success over the years. Uh, I can tell you recently in communicating with them that over the last few months, they make contact with a lot of individuals, but as of recently, uh, no one's accepted so, uh, offers of some services. But the effort is ongoing. Uh, still a lot of work to be done, but I mention all that just to say what a great community effort this is, both by, uh, you know, civic groups, our churches, and, uh, of, of course, Department of Behavioral Health working to do what we can to combat the issue and help our residents. Uh, and then maybe just uh, on a public safety issue and, and to give, uh, again, some accolades, uh, since I wasn't in attendance for our last council meeting, I didn't have an opportunity to express my appreciation for uh, the fire department and all of the agencies who responded to the fire we had on South End, right on the uh, edge of a uh, very populated portion of our community. Uh, they did a wonderful job quailing what was really uh, quite a volatile fire for quite a few hours. But to that point, I just want to remind everyone as we approach the 4th of July weekend, uh, fireworks uh, are illegal. And despite the fact that we may get a little precipitation tonight into tomorrow, I don't want anyone to be lulled into a sense of complacency. Uh, the amount of moisture we're going to get is not going to reduce the fire danger in our community. So uh, I implore everyone to be responsible and not to launch fireworks at, from the residents. Enjoy the displays that are being presented in our community and do what you can to keep the community safe otherwise. We will have quite a few extra deputies uh, and fire personnel all on proactive patrol for the holiday weekend. And really nothing would make us happier if everyone just enjoys the holiday responsibly and attends the fireworks shows put on by the town. But other than that, I don't really have anything more important to say. So I will conclude with that. Thank you, Captain. Appreciate that. Um, and then on our Zoom screen, you can bring up uh, Tom Jex, just because he looks so stoic there. Uh, council has to be able to see him. He may have some comments here on one of my items, but thanks for joining us, Tom. Uh, a couple of uh, quick thoughts, Council. So the presentation this evening on our Prop 68 Aquatics Project, just uh, we're, we're really excited about that. And I just want to ex express my thanks to our entire town team. A, a number of them are here this evening. Uh, it's been a lot of work. Uh, we all have regular activities that we're doing as part of uh, other responsibilities, and this fits in there, and it's uh, something that we have to do, and we like doing it. Um, but the team has been diligent in trying to do homework items that we're charged with. Uh, we try and keep, keep up with it. Sometimes it is a little bit difficult, but thank you to the entire team. I, I really appreciate that, and thank you to our project manager as well, Stephanie, and her firm. Um, we had the opportunity, uh, well, y you've heard the conversation about the Western Joshua Tree and the uh, infamous June meeting that was going to occur. So that meeting did occur. Uh, it occurred over the course of two days on Wednesday and Thursday of last week. I had the opportunity to participate in that meeting. 
provide some uh, public comment along with, I think, five or maybe six hours of other public comment in that meeting. And um, I, I guess I had four primary takeaways with that uh, outcome. So number one, it's, we thought maybe there would be direction. There, there was no direction. It was a 2-2 vote uh, on the question of whether to list or not list, and that provided the opportunity for the commission to take advantage of the, the rules that they operate under, which is the tree continues to receive protections absent an affirmative action. So tree uh, status of the tree is no different today than it was prior to the meeting. Some of the other observations was this is going to be a long-term issue for us. Uh, and for this community, there's no short answer. Their, their, their response was, well, let's come back in October and talk about it again. Um, but I think one of the comments that struck me uh, the, the most significantly was from, uh, interestingly, from one of the commissioners, Commissioner Sklar, that, uh, it, that voted no to the listing. Uh, but even his comment was, well, we've had species on our candidate, uh, on our candidate list for years. And that provides us flexibility in how we address this issue. So it's going to be uh, a long time. Um, in moving forward, how do we move forward? There's probably three different paths that I, I, I kind of foresee. One is operational. What can the town do? What should the town do? Um, on an operational standpoint, that's going to be the more technical basis of conversation with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, how we interpret, uh, you know, avoidance at this point takes out of the question that goes directly to the department. Um, enforcement is, lies completely with the department. But really, uh, how do we define avoidance? So uh, I guess operationally we won. Um, more broadly, I think politically is going to be a conversation for the commission as they move forward, um, primarily with respect to the potential appointment of a fifth commissioner. Right now they're operating with four out of five. There's a vacancy. It's a gov uh, governor appointment. We don't know when that's going to occur. So that uh, would be the political side. And then I presume that there will be opportunity for litigation approaches from a number of the parties. So um, I don't know if Shane or hmm. Tom, if either of you have anything additional that you want to add to that. but. Uh, those were my kind of takeaways from that meeting this uh, last week. I'm going to repeat what Curtis has indicated. Um, Commissioner Scalar's statement that other species have been under the study period for years is of great concern um, in terms of the town being able to take action. And in light of that, there's going to need to be some staff discussions and there may need to be staff coming back to the council and discussions. So do we start the process for an incidental take permit, which can take nine months to an excess of a year to obtain, um, and uh, quite expensive in that process? Do we initiate that process or do we wait to see further action? If they delay, if they, and delay is my word, if they don't take any action to list or not list, for an extended period of time, we may need to pursue that issue. But at the, at the end of the day, then the risk or the roll of the dice that we're making is they don't list the species and that money has been spent, uh, I'll use the word unnecessarily. Yet on the other hand, how long do we sit and take no action? And so uh, definitely we, I believe we were thrown for a loop. We expected action to be taken in June there's no indication of any light at the end of the tunnel, as Curtis has said. So not to drag that out any further, that's a huge issue, and not seeing any light at the end of the tunnel is very concerning. Tom, do you have any other thoughts that you wanted to share with the council this evening? No, I think uh, both of you provided a good summary, and I don't have anything additional to add. So thanks, Tom. We'll, uh, we'll keep the council community apprised. I think we'll probably over the course of the next week or so uh, draft up a couple of press releases, just ensuring that the community knows what the status is, knows where the obligations lie for take permits and enforcement, uh, and then kind of how we are, are going to move forward. So I um, wanted to give you that update. Interestingly, on, on Friday, we had the Desert Mountain Division meeting up in Mammoth Lakes, and there were a number of other affected cities, so Apple Valley, 
uh, Victorville, Hesperia. So the representatives there were also involved in this issue. In fact, some of them provided comment at the meeting on Wednesday. And uh, uh, I guess along those lines, a shout out to our supervisor who took a very active role in the county's approach uh, to try and support the department recommendation, which was not to list. Um, did a great job with her and her staff and some of the department staff at the county. Um, but at the end of the day, the commission did what they wanted to do. So um, let me just end with a couple of uh, positive things. So this Saturday, we have one of our family fun days. Um, this is our uh, themed event on Bugs Life. Uh, goes in conjunction with the exhibit that we have at the High Desert Nature Museum. So that's this Saturday from 10 to 2. It's a free event, crafts, games, learning opportunities for uh, the entire family. And then coming up on July 4th, we will have the fireworks presentation over at Brem. So we invite the entire community. You'll probably hear, uh, start hearing some radio spots on that. Uh, I think gates will open up around 6.30, concert from 7 to 8.30, 8.45, and then fireworks at 9 p.m. sharp. So should be some fun events for the beginning of summer, and we look forward to delivering those for you. That's it, Mayor. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Curtis. Uh, move on to council member comments and reports. Council member Abel. Uh, yeah, first of all, um, I sort of sweated during public comments because my wife's in the audience. I was afraid she's going to come up and uh, and uh, and tell me that I was in charge of making sure that uh, fee was paid. But um, I'll hear about it later tonight, maybe. Um, but other than that, um, I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. Jerry, congratulations to your retirement. And you are uh, going to be very missed. And I'm sure others are going to be uh, speaking to you about that. But uh, again, thank you all for all the years. Uh, Captain Niles, I want to thank your uh, deputy sheriffs for their active uh, activities in, in uh, pulling over a vehicle that contained explosives and bringing the bomb squad in and making sure everyone was safe. Uh, again, it just goes to show you that uh, a contract with the County of San Bernardino and the Sheriff's Department, the expertise that they bring uh, is invaluable to the safety of our community. So Captain Niles, please pass that on to the observant deputy sheriffs and uh, all those involved and those men and women on the bomb squad that risk their lives in, in detonating um, gunpowder and explosives. Um, I was sorry to hear the lady uh, that spoke to us or the representative speaking of the lady who applied for the uh, permit felt uh, she was hit, taken advantage of or blindsided. Uh, it sounded like it was uh, a beautiful thing for her to be able to be able to purchase a home up here and enjoy the high desert. Now, all of a sudden, it's a little tainted. So hopefully, um, if staff hasn't already reached out to her, we can we can do so. Uh, we don't want people to be feeling uh, negative about their impact or the, about their relationship with the town, uh, especially on something like that. Um, and then also, um, you know, I'm just a little afraid that if um, if we don't get this Joshua tree protected in a, in, a, in a mindful way, a way that we can protect the environment, protect the reasons why we live here, um, if we can't uh, seem to navigate that, I'm concerned about the price of homes here locally uh, because it basically is a moratorium and if no more homes are being built, the homes that we have now will continue to go up in, in price and it's already, affordability is already a real big issue. So um, that little concerning that we can't get past this, but uh, I'm just hoping that uh, level heads will get together and iron out something that uh, we can all live with and we can protect the environment in the same, uh, same, uh, at the same time. Uh, other than that, that's all I have tonight, and uh, thank you, and I'm very excited about the pool. Okay, Councilmember Droz. All right, well, um, tonight was a great meeting. Uh, first, I want to say um, congratulations to Jerry. So uh, enjoy your retirement. And Prop 68 is really, really exciting. It's um, something that we've needed for a long time. I mean, you know, the high school pool's been used since the 60s, and um, it's, it's pretty out of date. So that's really exciting news. And... Um, I guess that's it. I just want to say happy 4th of July. We'll see everybody after the 4th of July. So have a good evening. Councilmember Lombardo. Bob, congratulations for your well-deserved kudos. And uh, Jerry, thank you for all you've done. We're going to miss you. You got to have to come back and see that pool with all the things that you've helped to contribute to it. 
I'm sure you'll be as excited as we are to see it built. Um, Megan, she's not here, but uh, best wishes to you and your new life in Texas. And we're sorry we didn't get to meet your man who dragged you away. Uh, but we love him anyhow. Part of our family, always our family. Um, what else? Uh, the pool design, just I'm so excited I can't sit still. I'm thinking it's going to be one of the most beautiful buildings in Yucca Valley, but not for long, all right? We'll come up with something else in the future, but it's going to be really nice for the next 50 years, I'm sure. It's going to be something really special. Um, thanks again to our uh, sheriff's department for all they do and for our fire departments. I'm still looking for that fire station. I hear we're getting closer. Um, it's nice to work with all of you and our uh, staff at the town and under great leadership of Curtis. And I wish you all a safe 4th of July. And Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, thanks again to the man behind the camera, Bob Stevenson. Uh, thank you for uh, all the things that you do for us. And you're certainly very, very worthy. And this is just a small thank you for what you do for receiving the Spirit of Yucca Valley Award. Um, Jerry and Megan, uh, uh, two huge contributors to our community uh, on our team. And uh, Megan's taken off. I was wondering why uh, Curtis had called her the wrong last name. And I just <laughs> quickly had to put that together. And I go, oh, boy, here. And so I, I, I wish her uh, you know, the best going to Texas and, and her uh, new, uh, new husband and obviously a new life, different place. And then, Jerry, all the things you do, thanks. Uh, you know, I, I can't wait to get out there back to Afton Canyon with you, and you'll show me something new again. Um, Curtis was, I, I listened to the uh, two days of hearings uh, for the um, Fish and Wildlife Commission, and um, our town manager, Curtis, was there. Uh, he spoke, well, virtually spoke on the line, and um, uh, that, that's how I heard it. And very well, very, very brief, and very to the point of how concerning this is to our community. So I know. Uh, my, he's reflecting my thoughts there uh, clearly, I believe, for the council, too, and for the community. Uh, and he's there along with many others that have concerns about where this may go. And the delay is currently the only option that I heard at that meeting <coughs> was it's possible something may happen in October, but still no <coughs> certainty. Um, so we have a lot of work to do. And believe me, uh, your, your town is, is very concerned, and we're working hard for you on this one. Um, Thank you to Doug. Uh, the animal care and control services out there is not an easy task. Uh, you have to have the right heart for our animals in our town to find their way back home. Uh, my animals have uh, benefited from their services quite a few times in the past, and I'm very thankful that that continues today. I have a happy 4th of July. Please, everyone, it's going to be crowded again, as we know, as it is in the community. Uh, be safe, drive safe, and play safe. Uh, no fireworks. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, I echo all of those uh, comments and don't need to go through them all, but I do want to, again, uh, say congratulations to Bob on the uh, Citizen Spirit Award. And uh, he's waving. And Jerry, congrats on the retirement. You've been uh, a really, really good employee, you know, and, and good friend to the town. So uh, just uh, congrats, enjoy retirement. And also to Megan, good luck where she's going in Texas. I remind everybody that the summer concerts are coming up. First one is on 4th of July at that event. And then uh, uh, two weeks after that, they, they start up. And we have, what, about five more after that. So We're weekly. Yeah. And those will be back at the community center, right? OK, so uh, it looks like a fun summer. Looking forward to the pool project a couple summers from now uh, being completed. And um, with that, we'll close the comments and announce that the uh, Town Council meeting for Tuesday, July 5th has been canceled due to a lack of quorum. So the next regular meeting of the Yucca Valley Town Council will be held on Tuesday, July 19th, 2022 at 6 p.m. in the Yucca Valley Community Center Yucca Room. And with that, we'll adjourn this meeting. <laughs>